Раз, два, три, четыре, раз, два, раз, два. Раз, два, три, четыре, раз, два, раз, два, раз, два, три, четыре, раз, два. Раз, два, три, четыре, раз, два, раз, два, раз, два. Раз, два, три, четыре, раз, два, раз, два.
Miš, pohovorím anglicky. Zajte v anglicky. No nemu múti, keď nešam teda. Či nie? Čo? Áno, hovorím anglicky. Nu je. Ukrajinské, vidíte? Nu je. Один, два, три, четыре, английская, 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 английская. Один, два, три, раз, два, три, один, два, три, четыре, пять, шесть, семь, восемь, девять, десять, одиннадцать, двенадцать, тринадцать, четырнадцать, пятнадцать, шестнадцать, семнадцать, восемнадцать, девятнадцать, двадцать, двадцать один, двадцать два, двадцать три, один, все.
Можем починати. Отже, всім доброго дня. Вітаю наших онлайн глядачів. Uh, hello everybody. Uh, we would like to welcome our online viewers. We begin day two of this uh, conference. And today we are going to discuss the local uh, self-governance and decentralization issues. We have a lot of speakers. We have um, both the representative of the parliament, uh, which is Vitaly Bezin, who is uh, an MP from the Sluha Narodu faction. We have uh, a deputy minister of the, uh, uh, the development of Hromadas in Ukraine, Vyacheslav Nehoda. We have Tobias Tiber, who is an ambassador of Sweden to Ukraine. We also have an executive director of the Association of uh, Ukrainian Cities, Alexander Slobozhan. We also have Igor Kolyushko, who is uh, um, the head of the Center for Political um, and Legal Reforms, and Anatoly Tkachuk, who is the director uh, for uh, the scientific development of the Institute of uh, um, the uh, Civil Society. Uh, I would like to hear an introductory word from each of you. You could make a summary of what is uh, happening in terms of reforms, what has changed over the year, which are the key changes and developments, and immediately, just three points which you uh, think are needed uh, from the government or, or the social society or the parliament to continue the reform, to continue to move towards self-governance. Um, and I suggest that we start from you, Anatoly, uh, who is the director of the Institute of Civil Society, please. Hello, um, everybody. I'm very pleased that we can talk about this uh, today. I'd like to say a few uh, words. Uh, the first thing we have to accept as a fact in terms of the Ukrainian reform is that if the reform is uh, being prepared, even in the uh, most difficult times and uh, the sad times, it can be implemented. Uh, secondly, if the reform is prepared well, if it is implemented and generates positive results, it can be continued by a, another team, which uh, will, you know, will replace the previous team in a democratic way. Uh, and number three is that the, the, the Ukrainian reform has demonstrated that even in Ukraine, we can uh, 
perform the reform voluntarily. Uh, we can start it in a voluntary basis and end it uh, uh, in an administrative basis, and Ukraine, as they did in, in Europe. So Ukraine is Europe. Uh, next point. Uh, last year, uh, I'm happy that we finally turned uh, the page of the first uh, uh, the per first page of the reforms and uh, uh, all of Ukraine is covered with uh, new Romadas and new rayons and we can get down to the next stage which is the development uh, because um, before uh, the reform the uh, both the self-governance uh, and the activists who promoted this reform, they said that Kiev is not giving us money or Kiev is taking away too much money and we need budget for the decentralization and the Hromadas, the communities, uh, could not develop. However, now uh, we can't uh, say that uh, there's uh, some additional funds uh, that we can get by uh, reallocating uh, taxes. We have to develop Hromadas, we have to uh, develop the territories. And it, for the executive uh, uh, power, for the parliament and the president, the, the number one task is to get down to the develop, to the regional development, to the identification of the types of territories, to the formation of new tools of supporting those who can not uh, um, be self-sufficient and stimulate those who can become a lo locomotive of the development. That's uh, a number one task for the next period. Thank you very much. And I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Ihor Koliushko. From your side, what is the current status and what must be done and what should be the emphasis on next year? Hello, everybody. As we uh, make uh, a summary of this year in uh, the, the reform of uh, uh, the territorial organization and self-governance, I would like to dwell on uh, the rayon level, the uh, formation of new rayons, new districts, because I was responsible for the uh, drafting of that component of the reform. And I'd like to share with you some, uh, some uh, conclusions of that reform. Uh, first of all, I, I, I am absolutely supportive of what uh, Anatoly Fedorovich said, uh, that this reform is moving in a good pace, despite uh, various obstacles that uh, um, s seem to be there uh, on the political path. But uh, there is a, a difficult component as the administrative and territorial reform, uh, with uh, which not all uh, Western uh, European countries coped. Uh, we managed to cope with it this year. Uh, and I think uh, we have to thank uh, uh, to the current uh, uh, power for that, uh, um, who were responsible for it. So we have received 130, we have 136 rayons, districts. Um, it was an interesting situation associated with the fact that the government in its draft resolution uh, uh, drafted 129 rayons. The th theoretically, we calculated, uh, uh, I did the calculations and other experts calculated that it should be about 125 rayons. That would be the optimum number of rayons for Ukraine. Yuri Ganushchak was proposing a, a smaller amount, but the, the Verkhovna Rada, they included uh, various uh, political arguments. Uh, they decided to form 136 rayons um, and five or six of them uh, emerged just because the voting uh, was uh, postponed from uh, Tuesday to Thursday. So <laughs> just over the course of two days, uh, uh, five or six rayons uh, just uh, emerged. But not all the rayons conformed to the criteria that had been established. Uh, we have agreed, however, that without some substantial presentations, although I have a prepared one, uh, uh, maybe the organizers could send the pr my presentation to everybody, uh, to the participants, um, where I, I, I'm trying to demonstrate these figures, we have the smallest rayon of Verkhovina rayon with 136 residents, which doesn't comply with any criteria. We have eight rayons so from 66,000 to um, 22,000, 22 rayons, uh, up to 150,000 people. So all of these rayons are beyond the, the, uh, the limits uh, uh, established by the methodology. And um, we have to somehow 
uh, organize them today. Mm. Uh, also, we have a lot of uh, extra large rayons, uh, nine rayons, uh, uh, up to uh, 800,000 without any uh, reasons, uh, nor even geography. We have to understand that seven rayons based on uh, in, in the major cities that have 700,000 uh, um, residents will definitely be more than others, such as uh, Kharkiv, uh, Kharkivsky rayon in Kiev with uh, 1,700,000 residents. So if we um, uh, summarize this reform, uh, we can uh, uh, show a, a series of uh, ideas how we can improve it. But um, um, it's clear that we have to live and see and finalize the first stage of uh, the reform of, of the rayons. And that's what we have to do. Uh, first of all, we have to thank the parliament for voting yesterday. Uh, 36 um, of uh, for the draft to bill 3651. So there's a transitional period, but this bill, this uh, law must be signed to become effective. That's task number one. Task number two is to pass a new law on the local state administrations uh, whose draft uh, was submitted to the Verkhovna Rada. And um, these two laws will enable us to completely reform and launch uh, the uh, the uh, uh, local administrations in new rayons. Along with that, we have to pass a law on the administrative and territorial structure, um, which establishes the rules according to which we can upgrade, improve, and correct uh, the mistakes which uh, um, were made by a lot of rayons during the reform. And of course, uh, last but not least, is is the amendments in the constitution with regards to the self-governance and the uh, administrative organization. Because without these amendments, all the reforms associated with the local state administrations can be done partially only. Unfortunately, uh, after uh, a few uh, fix for starts uh, after this uh, draft law was submitted. Uh, um, uh, uh, the the power stopped. Uh, um, uh, various expert consultations took place this year, but there is no draft law yet, and that worries us because the polit political situation is changing, and a lot of people doubt whether the uh, the current parliament has a potential to approve such a draft bill uh, to amend the constitution. Thank you very much. Uh, to carry on the, the parliamentary potential, with the parliamentary um, uh, potential, we have um, Vitaly Bezgin, who is an MP and uh, a member of the sectoral committee. We have a question to you. Uh, the previous speakers has mentioned this. Uh, which are the three uh, uh, key sectors that you believe um, um, must be uh, passed uh, this year or next year to carry on the reforms. So, thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I think I'm going to abuse my time and uh, we'll try to answer this question in a broader way. I'll start off by saying that uh, uh, it's my second time in uh, such a forum. Uh, the first uh, time was last year. We were talking about the roadmap, how to move forward. Uh, a lot of uh, ex experts and uh, uh, the local administrations um, and the representatives of the executive power were concerned because the power has changed the parliament. The parliament has substantially uh, changed. We weren't sure if we were going to follow the roadmap um, that uh, uh, emerged before we emerged in uh, politics. It's been a year and we can argue that the promises have uh, turned uh, into facts. Everything was um, fulfilled even though not many people believe that we can bring the country uh, to uh, the election in a year, then people didn't believe that we can vote uh, 36, 14 uh, draft. Then um, finally, we are talking here after the draft bill um, was uh, voted on yesterday. So if we talk about the reform of decentralization for the Ukrainian power, there are a few, few factors. The first one is the reform which um, has 
preserved its uh, uh, carriers in the institutional memory. And, and there is a symbiosis of the executive uh, power, the uh, youth uh, and experience, um, um, uh, which neglected nobody. I think uh, it enabled us to move forward. And I think it's the most successful reform in Ukraine for the last six years. And of course, uh, uh, a lot of people are responsible for this reform. Now, with regards, um, I'll make a reflection on uh, the rayons issue. I remember we were sitting and discussing with Igor uh, and Ivan Ganushak. I would agree that 136 is not uh, a good number. It's not a perfect number. Some of the rayons are small, others are bigger. We realize because there's a different, different density of the population, but uh, but the, uh, the Rakhona Rada is a political body and it's better to have some difficulties or imperfections, uh, but to get a good result rather than to ruin everything. In terms of the next steps, I believe that we have um, the ministry along with the experts uh, and the, uh, along with the MPs and the associations has uh, 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 provided a draft bill uh, on the local administrations, 4298. I hope that despite the quarantine, we will uh, be done with the first reading and in January we'll be done with the second reading. Obviously, we need a draft bill on the administrative and territorial structure. Uh, it doesn't matter what the title will be, but it has to regulate, govern uh, uh, some uh, rules of the play and to fix it uh, in the law. And the constitutional amendments, it's our pain, but we do need these uh, amendments without cementing the uh, um, uh, uh, this issue. Uh, the reform will be uh, threatened by the opponents. Uh, everyone who is viewing us today and everyone who is present here, we know that uh, we should have started from the constitutional amendments, but we have the current status and we have to think about uh, um, completing this reform. And I believe that the potential of the parliament can vary, but yesterday's voting uh, for uh, such a complex draft bill with, uh, which was uh, passed by the constitutional majority of uh, 301 uh, votes uh, uh, means that we have um, uh, um, a potency uh, to um, uh, to uh, vote uh, for the constitutional amendment. So, so there should be trust between the local administrations, the experts, executive power, uh, legislative power, and the president, the presidential office. That all will enable us to. Um, come up with the good outcomes and the Hromadas, the communities will be happy with those uh, with the outcome and that will be the actual implementation in life. Thank you very much. I think we can get down to the position of the Hromadas, the communities. We have Alexandra Sobozhan, uh, the Association of Ukrainian Cities. Uh, what is the position of the association and are you happy with the current status of the reform implementation and what do you expect of the parliament and of the government uh, uh, the first three steps or the, the key points which in your opinion should um, uh, should the parliament and the government be working on together to continue the reform hello uh, thank you for your question i think my tone will be slightly different from everybody else if we were completely happy I think we should be dismissed now and shouldn't be sitting here and shouldn't be doing anything. Um, for the most part, it's 95%. Uh, the key stakeholders are the municipalities, the Hromadas. The three key points, uh, dialogue, uh, trust, because uh, one doesn't exist without the other. There's the budget, money, and it's about people with regards to the uh, dialogue and uh, the trust. Let me continue uh, Mr. Vitali's uh, uh, statement. And for me personally, in the summertime, I mentioned this to him as some prospective uh, uh, plans uh, for the newly formed communities were uh, passed. You remember there were a hundred comments this thick that I wasn't speaking at uh, the government there, but I made a statement to you and to Mr. Korinenko that I trust that format as long as the draft bill 3614 is passed, which was uh, approved. And I'm happy that Mr. Tobias is here with us and our European partners, our international partners. If it is passed, 
this not only will be about money, it's going to be about trust and it's going to be about the dialogue between the uh, Hromada and other stakeholders. The president, uh, his office, the cabinet of ministers, the members of parliament, the expert community. So now comes the next step and it's associated with this week and quarantine. There are a lot of problems in terms of the dialogue and we held that we had six questions uh, uh, to meet with the president. Uh, uh, 3614 bill was one of these questions, but the dialogue hasn't taken place yet. And hopefully by the day of self-governance, it'll take place and so, so that we could understand strategically how we are moving forward. Uh, the day before yesterday at the meeting with the prime minister, uh, Mr. Klitschko said, and other uh, city mayors said that we are in the same boat and we have to think how to build, how to save the economy, how to save the people. Number two, the budget and the money. I don't agree. And every time, uh, and I've always mentioned this, colleagues, the budgetary decentralization has not taken place. It's just the first stage of this important reform, of the common reform. I don't even, uh, I, I view this reform as a common, common reform, as a, as a single reform. Uh, the budgetary decentralization de facto has not taken place. We've just made the first step, the first stage. Uh, we've, um, we have introduced uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the fair equalization. So, and if the mayors call me on Saturday and they said that uh, the budget for the next year in their cities is uh, zero percent if they have short shortages, if they cannot fund the laws which were recently adopt, adopted, and uh, some um, uh, members of parliament call them populist uh, laws, and they don't have money to execute, to enforce those laws. Which decentralization are we talking about? We have to increase the efficiency of uh, the local revenues and taxes uh, and tax collection. Uh, we have to exchange the data between the communities and the fiscal bodies. Uh, uh, we have to uh, uh, administer them in high quality because the Hamadas don't actually uh, impact the local development because of these uh, tools, because the tax administration does not care about it. We have a lot of benefits. There's one example, uh, Ukrasalizitsa, which is Ukraine railway, uh, decided to get some benefits. It's an enterprise with a net profit of 3 billion grivna last year. So after taxes, it's a ne next profit means after taxes. So they don't have to pay dividends to the government and they decided to, uh, to gain additional benefits. Now they are interfering with the local tax. So we are ruining the basis of the fiscal decentralization. If everyone is relieved from the local taxes, what are the Hamadas going to do? Why do we need the communities then? So the budgetary decentralization should be should continue. We have to improve the tax code and the budgetary code. I understand there's a lot of criticism now uh, over the local uh, sales tax uh, or the oil uh, excise, um, which exists in Canada, in uh, America. But unless we come up with the compensators, the Hromadas next year should have some development budgets. And the third, uh, 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 Yesterday, Mr. Kornienko at the committee meeting noted a, a very reasonable point. It's the matrix of uh, HR transition. Uh, this, uh, uh, this draft bill, and Mr. Kolyushko said, uh, this draft bill must be signed today or tomorrow because time is running. It's about hours to reorganize these obsolete uh, administration bodies so that the uh, ministry could get the new uh, uh, leverage of impact. But th there will be uh, no um, uh, large uh, scale uh, redundancy. So uh, everybody who is going to come to the president and convince him that this draft law for any reason should not be signed uh, immediately, they all are under panic. Uh, and uh, they are all traitors. We have to sign this draft as soon as possible. And 
next uh, is uh, the, the draft bill is consolidated for the local administrations. Uh, there should be HR, there should be manpower, the, 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 there should be staff uh, that we will hand this over to. And next is the administrative structure and the constitution and so on and so on. We spoke uh, with Vitaly uh, about this yesterday. Why should it be 3651D? Uh, there should be 301 votes uh, who would uh, support this draft uh, law, not 50% uh, of the of the vote of, of the um, uh, MPs. Uh, if all uh, is agreed upon, we will have constitutional amendments. Yeah, thank you very much. I assume uh, Mr. Vyacheslav has a reaction to uh, Alexander's uh, speech. Uh, and number two, the ministry has prepared uh, uh, the new. Uh, version of the law on self-governance uh, uh, in Ukraine. What are the priorities for you? Um, what are the key priorities? And what do you expect um, of the parliament and of the uh, association of cities and the experts? Which assistance do you expect to continue the implementation of the reform? Hello, everybody. Thank you very much um, for uh, your invitation uh, to this discussion. I believe that um, God is helping us, that it is today that we are meeting after the parliament yesterday passed a very important a decision, made a very important decision. And according to Mr. Slobodan, it's not just a decision. They passed a, a law and there's 226 votes. It's a very important political decision. Uh, so all the factions voted. So it's 300 plus one. So all the factions voted for uh, these amendments uh, with the understanding that the reform which is taking place today is vital for everybody, for the people, for the political parties, um, for our society and for the development of the country. So uh, I wouldn't like for us to talk about the conclusions uh, or the summary of this reform. It's too early. Uh, we can uh, use the, the rhetoric of what is the, where's the first stage, what is the second stage, and what one of the stages, and so on. So over this time span, from the concept, we went all the way through the, the important decision by holding the next uh, local election at uh, the new territorial basis, on the new basis. So it's the... Um, start to continue the decentralization because over this uh, time i would agree with uh, uh, alexander slobojan we have had several important uh, milestones without which we wouldn't be able to make conclusions of the year 2020 so conceptually like anatoly fedorovich said uh, who started along with the team the work uh, uh, theoretical uh, they, they developed the theoretical basis of the reform in the regions, the mechanisms of its implementation. So we didn't uh, go the classical way, but we had a, a goal. We have this goal and we have to attain this goal. Uh, we haven't attained this final goal yet uh, through, uh, we tried to, to uh, convince uh, uh, the society through uh, voluntary amalgamation, that the Hromados are capable, that, that they can uh, demonstrate performance, that we uh, are bringing in the changes. We didn't start the reform like uh, some classical people did as they said, okay, let's change the administrative and territorial structure. Let's create these many rayons and, and regions and so on. We went in a different way. We tried to convince the society that we need this and we can do this. Secondly, which is also important, the reform of self-governance, let's call it decentralization. Decentral there are several decentralizations. First is the decentralization of the, the administrative decentralization, budgetary decentralization. We can talk about other sectors uh, which operate sectoral decentralizations and the most important one is that we realize that decentralization can be carried out only by forming the basis the territorial basis so we did this all together i 
wouldn't like to point out to anyone. There is no game without a team. Just like yesterday in Switzerland, in football, uh, two uh, two men uh, were missing in, in the team, so the football team uh, lost. Uh, so that uh, wouldn't really work. Uh, we wouldn't work here without a team either. Uh, and here I'd like to, as, as I make a, a summary of this year, um, um, I'd like to point out to the important role of the decisions that the government has undertaken, because the process of uh, voluntary amalgamation is okay, but uh, we know that in the midst of the year, um, a lot of uh, different political and international forces mobilized themselves and argued that uh, we don't want to get to the administrative decision. That is true. We were on the edge. Not everything was uh, uh, under publicity, but they were proposing to us, let's carry on such a uh, slow decentralization for another five years. But I would rather call it a, a frozen decentralization. So the decision of the government was very difficult uh, in all respects with respect to the approval of uh, territorial, territorial Romadas or communities. Mm, I, uh, I remember the members of uh, the government and Prime Minister um, Schmigal, who uh, undertook this um, important political and legal responsibility. So without that responsibility, we wouldn't have the riots and the, uh, without the Romadas in the riots, we wouldn't be able to move forward. So as we talk, I'd like to say a few more words about the summary. Uh, recently, we presented um, uh, a poll, um, and it's very important that the self-governance reform, uh, uh, according to this poll, uh, is still supported by the residents of Ukraine. I can't speak for everybody. That's the only, but that's the only reform which is supported by Ukrainian residents in such high percentage and where they give us 59.5% uh, of uh, support. People did feel the results from decentralization, uh, even though half of the um, um, uh, communities still lived with, without decentralization. That uh, gives us um, a lot of hope. What should we done? Uh, yesterday, they uh, passed uh, this bill 3651. I would like to repeat uh, Mr. Slobozhan's words that we have to immediately sign this law. Uh, on my, on, from our side, we, the ministry, are trying to convince everyone that everything should take place promptly because ahead of us we have very little time. We have only one uh, month of time and over this time we have to solve the problem of, of delineation of properties between the rayons and Romadas, uh, the division, um, uh, the uh, formation of new administrations, uh, um, we have to solve a lot of other uh, pro problems which require uh, complex uh, uh, solutions. Some, uh, um, a series of decisions of the government should, uh, uh, um, a series of decisions should, uh, should, should, should be made in terms of the formation of the administration's reorganization of other administrations, the appointment of heads of rayon administrations through the government and uh, by the president. So we have to institutionally, by the end of the year, complete a lot of work so that on the 1st of January with the new budgetary year, we could get down to the new system of territorial organization of power. And speaking of the reform, we shouldn't miss out an, an important aspect. Our key goal is to improve the system of, of territorial uh, uh, organization of power, and we have to create a strong self-governance system. And at the Gromada level, at the Gromada, uh, Gromada level, and then at the subsidiarity uh, level, uh, um, sub-regional level. But um, along with that, we have to to say that along with the decentralization of powers, we have to create an efficient system of territorial organization of executive power. Unfortunately, it's inefficient and we shouldn't um, forget that uh, 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 three or four times 
more officials uh, uh, work in the system but it's uh, 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 and uh, the, a lot of with a lot of functions a lot of uh, 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 issues are solved at the executive level and we shouldn't miss that out and we also should understand that the collaboration and understanding between the self-government and those authorities are also very important and they should become efficient partners in the legislative framework my colleague already mentioned what we should uh, do and i would not repeat so we are awaiting the signing of the law in the parliament and by the president of ukraine that uh, tomorrow we should start implementing this legislation and continue uh, reforming and developing of the community thank you uh, thank you. I believe that uh, one of the components uh, that this reform is so successful uh, is uh, the point uh, that we are supported by our international partners. And these are the countries of the um, EU and also the US uh, were supporting us in implementing the reform. That's why I would like to pass the floor to his uh, honor, uh, Mr. Ambassador and what should be the steps to be taken by the state to make this uh, reform sustainable and what should be done uh, to continue this successful uh, path of the reform um, thank you so much for us um, for uh, for this question and for for allowing me to take part in today's important discussion um, you asked two questions at the beginning of this panel. You asked what uh, has been achieved and what remains to be done. And very much has been already said um, on this topic by preceding speakers who have vastly more competence and understanding of this issue than I do. Uh, so I'm not going to elaborate on, on those specific questions except to say two things about those. The first one is, I think it is worthwhile for everyone to take a step back and consider how much has really been achieved in this tremendously important reform so far. Uh, Ukraine has a new uh, territorial administrative um, uh, division. That is a huge step. It is something which typically takes decades uh, to reorganize uh, this, the territory of the state, and Ukraine has achieved it under conditions which have been quite difficult politically. Um, uh, the basis for, for the fiscal sustainability of the new uh, uh, communities um, has been established by law this summer. Um, and not least importantly, local elections were held in the end of October, which was the first time that Ukrainian citizens had an opportunity uh, to decide who was to represent them at the local level in the empowered Gromadas. So I think this is really important um, to just keep in mind, and I'd like to particularly point to a thing that Mr. Tkachuk uh, mentioned in his intervention, namely that these changes have been carried out by successive Ukrainian democratically elected governments who have had strong political um, divisions between themselves but have managed to come around this issue and support it from their def different points of view. I think this is so far an important achievement and I think that it is important that we all take energy um, and optimism from what has been achieved because we know that very much remains to be done. Um, when it comes to, to what remains um, to be done, uh, this has also been mentioned by the preceding speakers in, 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 in detail and that there's no reason for me, for me to, um, to repeat it. We're talking about the law on local state administration and local self-government, the completion of the division of tasks between the central level and the local level. What are delegated powers? What are the, um, uh, the um, uh, independent powers of, of the newly established communities? All of this remains to be done. It's a long path, and I'm sure that Ukraine will be successful uh, in completing this reform as it has been successful in taking it as far as we have come today. Um, the only thing I would like to add to this important discussion is not so much what needs to be done, but rather how uh, it needs to be done. And here I would like to underline the crucial importance of a transparent and consultative process, a process which includes um, an open, transparent, serious and deep and well-organized debate between the members of the RADA, the four associations of local self-governance which exist um, in Ukraine, 
uh, involving the expert community and not least, of course, involving the organizations of civil society. It's going to be messy. It's going to take a lot of time. It's going to be frustrating. Um, and uh, as Mr. Uh, Bezgin um, mentioned, sometimes the possible uh, solution is not the ideal solution, but it's a lot better than no solution at all. Um, and so I would really like to encourage uh, all Ukrainian stakeholders to take this process forward in the spirit of, of uh, true consultation and transparency. Um, because a final word, um, Deputy Minister Nigoda said something extremely important. There's probably no reform in Ukraine today which enjoys such strong support among Ukrainian citizens um, as the local self-governance uh, reform. So I believe that all of us uh, share a responsibility uh, to the citizens of Ukraine to successfully carry out this reform. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I would like to thank uh, for mentioning not only the goals, but how we should achieve those. Also mentioning the transparency and accountability. And um, as we are lacking time, and uh, we will only have uh, only one question which we can discuss, and this is uh, the one uh, which is uh, very crucial for a number of uh, communities so that's uh, about the fund of the regional development and as we are awaiting uh, the uh, adopting of the budget uh, 2021 i have a question to uh, mr vitaly basin what we should uh, uh, wait for from the parliament in the policy um, of uh, regional development and we hope that we will uh, have the second reading of the budget. What the communities and the grom uh, gromadas uh, should uh, wait for, especially in the area of uh, social uh, policy. Uh, thank you. I will ask you to um, answer the first a number of times the, the stakeholders mentioned uh, that uh, the uh, fund of the uh, regional uh, development is uh, that crucial uh, agency which should uh, stimulate uh, the development uh, of uh, communities and it's very good that it's a, a similar vision uh, of the parliament of the cabinet of ministers and of the minister uh, what we are anxious uh, about um, after the first reading so it was uh, the legislation was shortened uh, and it's a bit different uh, from uh, the uh, from what the ministry uh, has submitted and uh, what uh, uh, the committee uh, has drafted so uh, we believe uh, that uh, this uh, sh the number should be changed uh, uh, that we could not only finish uh, the uh, projects which we have started, but also to start the new project. So uh, uh, why uh, this law on uh, social policy and social uh, economy is so popular? Because um, we do uh, receive uh, votes uh, uh, from uh, our electors. So when uh, social economy, uh, is cutting the uh, resources of uh, the funds of the regional development, um, uh, then it, it's a very dubious way. That's why the stake uh, should be around the fund of the regional development. So if we are speaking about the budget allocations, um, I will repeat uh, what uh, Mr. Slobashan uh, have mentioned. So first of all, we should be very strongly supporting the fund. I will not uh, mention uh, the exact number, and B, we should not uh, uh, allow uh, that uh, the Ukrozaliznitsya uh, not to pay the uh, land uh, tax. Uh, we cannot uh, do this without the compensations uh, to the local uh, communities. We should receive a successful uh, outcome after the consultations. Thank you. I see that Alexander Slavajan is willing to comment. 
Mr. Vitali was uh, very diplomatic in his speech uh, about uh, uh, social uh, economy. In, in fact, it's a shame. Uh, now we have been watched not only in um, foreign countries, but also the MPs are watching today's uh, conference. So uh, why the Minister uh, of Finance is doing this? So uh, colleagues, uh, please do vote for the fund of, of the regional development. Uh, and uh, they are, uh, the funds for the social economy uh, are not secured, those uh, 30 million. Yes, the numbers for the fund uh, decreased uh, were decreased so we uh, also submitted uh, of 40 uh, amendments um, and uh, so from first and second reading uh, we uh, had the amendments that we should uh, increase uh, the number from 1.8 million to 4.8 8 million for the fund of the regional development the minister of finance for the september uh, for the social development, uh, some numbers, and we should uh, be looking at uh, the, uh, our um, uh, economics uh, from um, a very, not uh, positive, uh, but a real uh, point of view. So uh, the uh, fund of the regional development is secured, and we uh, hope that uh, this um, legislation will be in line with the strategy of the regional development and with the regional strategies. But what is uh, also important about uh, the fund of the regional development and uh, why uh, I'm talking this uh, in front of Mr. Ambassador, the EU uh, is uh, supporting Ukraine in different uh, uh, programs, sectoral support, uh, there are some ecological uh, funds. They are provided, as we know, only if there is a transparent, if patient calculation uh, of those funds as it was uh, done by uh, the uh, fund of regional defense and uh, so uh, social economy uh, social economy uh, will not receive uh, the funds from the eu and uh, ministry of uh, economy is now doing a very good job uh, in the sectoral support and I'm paying attention of uh, our international partners that uh, this uh, subvention for social economy uh, is uh, not a very good idea. That's why we believe that the Fund of Regional Development should be supported. And even there is a Council of uh, Donors. And uh, as for now, we have uh, Mr. Ambassador, you represent not only your country, but you are uh, also uh, heading um, and represent all others. So I do remember when uh, you united your efforts uh, about the legend uh, 3614 and uh, 3651 is, uh, also needs your support. And also please support uh, the uh, Fund of Regional Development. Uh, Mr. Negoda, please, the floor is yours. Uh, dear colleagues, um, I'm very pleased uh, that when we're speaking about the regional development and the fund of regional development, and I was uh, involved in this process at all the stages, that uh, the fund is only one of the tools. And Ukraine uh, has uh, drafted uh, the good legislation and we adopted a, a good legislative uh, framework for the regional development based uh, on uh, the best European practices. But we need uh, funds uh, for this development and uh, this uh, financing uh, is uh, uh, should be in uh, the budget. Um, which cannot uh, be then uh, transferred uh, to other allocation because uh, in this uh, fund uh, uh, the, the uh, in this regional development fund uh, some of the costs uh, should be defined divided between the regional and local levels 
and then we have uh, uh, some uh, people coming to the powers and uh, saying that we have different uh, priorities for example for today uh, these are the schools and then that we need some stadiums and that we need some uh, uh, hotels and so we have uh, this discrepancy uh, that uh, the region is willing to, uh, to have uh, uh, funds for the specific projects they have drafted and then someone from the top is saying no they should uh, be allocated to a different um, sphere so uh, all the best uh, european practices are uh, neglected that's why we believe that uh, social economy subvention uh, is uh, a very bad tool and uh, that uh, the fund original development is a really excellent tool and it should be supported you were already mentioning the donors and i will do the same ukraine signed uh, with the eu uh, the agreement on the support uh, of the uh, support for the regional development and when we look uh, which projects uh, are submitted there and to see uh, what uh, the uh, fund of uh, regional development is doing these are two different uh, things and it would be great if EU could find uh, uh, the funds uh, for the uh, regional development uh, fund, then we could show uh, that we could uh, have great uh, results uh, in uh, the regional development through the activities of the regional development fund. Mr. Nikoda, the floor is yours. I will not repeat those very right words which were said uh, by Vitaly and Alexandra and Anatoly about the regional policy and of the regional development fund. The regional policy was the topic which we started to discuss from uh, 2010 or even earlier, but the decision in the parliament, the two legislation in one day the law uh, on the original uh, policy and uh, on the amalgamated uh, community uh, was adopted in February 2015. And it shows that those two topics at the beginning of the reform uh, were uh, considered as uh, something uh, uh, amalgamated, in fact. So uh, our reform uh, is aimed to develop the territorial uh, communities because the development is happening in the communities, in fact. Uh, so well, it's not the, uh, the territories which are developing, but that the communities are uh, which are developing. That's one. Uh, the task is to uh, form, to establish the communities uh, which are, are capable uh, to develop and uh, that's one of the tasks uh, of the uh, fund for uh, the regional development uh, uh, to assist uh, the communities uh, in uh, their activities and we believe uh, that we should uh, use the experience uh, both of uh, our national uh, experience as well as the, the um, european experience uh, but besides i would like to mention that 2021 is a very important year for us because we have more than 700 territorial communities which will start the activities from the scratch these are the communities uh, which do not have any institutional memory they do not have any experience uh, of development or of planning uh, or even development strategies so there were subventions uh, um, for the support of the um, voluntary legitimated communities now there are no such subventions that's why with the association of cities we were requesting the parliament we had a suggestion that for 2021 we should support the forming of the uh, centers of administrative power uh, services uh, which are provided now um, at uh, the uh, regional administrations so if not a separate uh, subvention to develop this uh, centers of administrative services not uh, at least in uh, 2021 20, uh, but uh, we should foresee uh, that it could be developed uh, through the fund of regional development but it means uh, that the um, 
a big amount of funds should be allocated. We should consider how we can support uh, the newly uh, formed uh, communities, which will start the activities only in 2021. We believe that the budget year 21 uh, will be very complicated and it's very difficult uh, to foresee how it will go. I hope uh, I'm wrong in, in my suspicions. And uh, further, uh, we could have uh, uh, those talkings that uh, you can see how the digitalization uh, is uh, not going in the right direction. Uh, that's why I believe that uh, the uh, fund is a very good uh, tool which should be used uh, by, uh, the, uh, uh, by the fund. Uh, about the fund, uh, I will not. Be, I will not be speaking about the fund because everything has been mentioned already in full. Uh, but uh, we were speaking about the districts, and today in the constitutional court uh, there is a constitutional claim. And uh, though the, uh, the alleged uh, unconstitutional. Uh, form of this decision uh, and we are quite surprised about this in this claim it's written uh, in fact a lot of words and sentences are written there uh, but uh, the uh, provision of the constitution uh, under which uh, this legislation was uh, adopted um, and uh, where it is stipulated that uh, they uh, power of the uh, parliament is uh, to form the districts and to name, uh, rename uh, the territorial units. And it looks like uh, those who submitted this claim haven't read uh, the constitution very thoroughly before they submitted uh, the claim. Uh, sometimes we're surprised with the uh, rulings uh, of the constitutional court, uh, but uh, I believe that in this claim there is no threat uh, that uh, this reform uh, could be uh, eliminated. Thank you. And the last question to Mr. Ambassador, what to your mind, uh, to what uh, we should pay attention uh, to uh, provide the efficient uh, regional development? what should be the priority right now for the reform to continue successfully? Um, since much has already been said about the um, regional uh, development fund, I, I, I won't um, make any additional comments about that except to say two things. Number one, the fund needs to be funded. There needs to be money in there. Otherwise, what's the point? Um, and I think, as Deputy uh, Deputy Minister Nigoda said, um, it, there's an extremely, I think, strong connection between the Regional Development Fund on the one hand and the issue of local self-governance on the other, because uh, if there aren't um, resources available to carry out development projects, then the, um, then the local self-government uh, bodies will only be empowered in name, but not in fact. So I think that's extremely important. The second point, clearly there has to be transparent, predictable um, and honest method by which uh, the projects to be funded under the Regional Development Fund um, are identified. And, and I think there is probably a lot of work to do in that area um, still. Uh, the final thing I wanted to mention about the um, about the, the, the completion of uh, local self-governance reform refers to the um, extremely important uh, question of supervision uh, of local self-government. Um, this uh, is a question which needs to be solved in its own specific way in each country. There's no ideal model, there's no universal model, there's, there's no best practice in the world because there's only a best practice for any given country which depends on that country's history, its experiences, its current political situation, its culture, uh, its habits, etc. So um, the only point that I would like to make uh, in this context is, is, is that what is important are the principles underlying the form of supervision. And here I think it is extremely important that whatever, uh, whatever method uh, Ukraine identifies going forward should be uh, in compliance with the fundamental document um, regulating everything that has to do with local self-government in Europe. 
and that is the Council of Europe uh, Charter on Local Self-Governance. Uh, Ukraine is a European country, um, and I think it owes it to its citizens to adhere to the principles, the European principles about local self-governance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, uh, that uh, you mentioned uh, the supervision uh, in uh, the context of the self-government. Uh, we do believe that it's a very important topic. And now the comment from the Association of Cities of Ukraine. And uh, should it be a soft supervision? Uh, in what form uh, should the supervision be conducted? What's the position of uh, uh, the Alliance of Cities uh, of Ukraine? How it should be solved? Thank you for the question. For a long years, years this discussion is going on but uh, the term which is uh, using uh, is uh, the point is that uh, we are now uh, not using uh, the term uh, control but uh, we are using uh, the uh, supervision the draft law which is uh, submitted about the local uh, administration was discussed a lot and um, we also said that it should be transparent and efficient and not to be considered uh, as a pressure. Uh, this part uh, should be uh, mirrored from the local self-governance uh, to uh, the law on the local self uh, local uh, administrations. Why we have this very tough stance about the control or supervision we used to call it control, but now we call it supervision. We know about this uh, pact of the oppositional mayors of uh, Warsaw and so on. When uh, those legislative tools they are in line with the European Charter, but it is used uh, by the uh, government uh, to uh, make pressure on the local uh, government in one municipality before uh, the local elections 300 uh, criminal cases were opened it's very complicated to have a discussion under the rifles it's very complicated First of all, we should uh, have the trust and dialogue, and we are now building this through the legislation, through the law 3614. Uh, the position which is now described uh, in the law, it's a compromise. I believe that the central uh, authorities would uh, love to have more, um, and the local uh, administrations would uh, like to have less. And uh, we believe that compromise is the best decision. But we will come to the formalization of uh, these um, issues. And I'm supporting uh, Mr. Ambassador that uh, we should not uh, only copy the wordings uh, from the uh, European uh, legislation, but also the spirit uh, which is uh, used uh, concerning the supervision. The Association of Cities was never against the supervision. It was uh, against uh, the specific wordings, which now uh, were um, some efforts to put them in some legislation. It was under the government of Mr. Groisman when we were against uh, the specific amendment uh, and in the constitutional amendments, we also were against the specific amendments. We do not want to uh, have this uh, supervision as a pressure. That's our stance. And we cannot uh, negotiate, uh, not may, maybe not, not negotiations, but finding the um, common position when uh, one of the parties, I will uh, say frankly, when the representative of the president at the sitting of uh, the profile committee is saying, we are submitting this am uh, amendment about the, the uh, control or supervision of the uh, local administration. Uh, uh, and they are saying, um, because uh, the local administration allowed uh, uh, that the Donbass was occupied. Of course, that that's the ending of the dialogue. So you should understand what the session of city is. It's 
911 uh, communities uh, and it's around 85 percent uh, of uh, ukraine are living there so we are this uh, front uh, post uh, and we uh, are saying uh, the position of uh, the local uh, government so we are being pressed from different uh, sides that's why i would like uh, to underline that we are not against the procedure of supervision which is in the european charter uh, we are saying about uh, the wordings and about uh, the uh, amendment and it's very good that the international partners supported us and some experts and also we had a discussion with uh about some specific wordings we will come back to this uh, topic and i would like everyone to hear uh, and also the newly elected heads uh, of the communes when uh, the provision will be written uh, in the good uh, way and it will be an active efficient mechanism we will be for so why don't i have enough trust how can we talk about the rotation of uh, projects if we eliminate the National Academy of Public Administration. How can we prepare for something if uh, Vasily Kubida has prepared some programs and suddenly they liquidate this academy? Yeah, yeah. please. Vyacheslav Andronovich was talking about the poll. In this poll, there were several questions. Um, do you? support the oversight over legality do you support the oversight over the uh, lack of um, activity so uh, 90 percent uh, uh, supported that because people uh, saw the possibility of capsuling the local authorities that cannot hear anybody and have no uh, bearing on anybody uh, so decentralization is the powers resources and responsibilities right on the they did something on the first two they forgot the third one we uh, debated with uh, alexander when we were discussing the liberal version of the oversight and i said it's better to to do the liberal version of the oversight today because tomorrow it can the there will be a very non-liberal version the situation is going to change now we've got into the pandemic and we see a conflict between the government power and local self-governance uh, so the situation with the oversight is getting worse in terms of the local governments so because in a conflict the government is going to try to uh, establish a hard oversight but it's not over yet because by introducing the party elections in the local governments uh, the parliament has provoked the political conflict at the local level the political tensions that will emerge mean that we will forget about oversight we will only have control so i'd like to approach the local governments and the association of cities that it's better to introduce a liberal oversight today rather than have a hard control tomorrow and we're getting there without an oversight nothing's going to happen and finally, since I have mentioned the politicization of uh, the councils, it's a it's very unsafe. As we as we introduced the decentralization of the hromadas, we were talking about uh, um, sowing of uh, the hromadas uh, through these uh, uh, centers, um, through horizontal centers, and the employees of the territorial hromadas, and that was the right um, opinion, which uh, resisted uh, to the expansion of Russia. Today, by introducing the a political election, by forming uh, diverse uh, regional councils without an oversight, we can get uh, a challenge of uh, the state's consolidation. Uh, so we have to introduce the oversight, and we have to implement uh, the policy of consolidation which is uh, envisaged by the state uh, uh, strategy 2027 this strategy of regional development thank you our final question and uh, the conclusions uh, are very important in fact uh, the component of the powers of the resources and the responsibilities where the two first ones uh, work there should also be a responsibility and responsibility has a number of components it's not just a, a responsibility to the state it's a responsibility to your amalgamated community to your uh, voters and also you have to be responsible uh, liable to the law 
uh, not to the parliament, not to the president, but you have, you have to be responsible to the law. So when we use these terms, uh, I, I wouldn't like to hear a question that an oversight over the local governments. No, there should be an oversight uh, over the decisions of the local governments in terms of their legality. No one is going and no one should control them. Although, colleagues, I like to argue, uh, you know perfectly that according to the current constitution, if there is a willingness, let's not unveil all the secrets, the constitution enables for control over the local governments, a hard control, and it also al allows for other uh, methods of impact. Uh, so we shouldn't start from, you know, submachine guns, right? Um, maybe he saw some 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 toys somewhere, uh, but we have to govern this somehow. We should have a procedure in place. And I think that it is the local governments that in such conditions, in the decentralized uh, Ukrainian conditions, should stimulate the government and the parliament to organize the procedures uh, uh, of introducing the, uh, of the state oversight over their decisions. It's the, it's the local governments who should be interested in that. Uh, if I ask a mayor or I, do you want to make an illegal decision? No, I don't want to. Well, what's the problem then? Uh, so we have to create a mechanism uh, where we would have a, a partnership uh, interaction as they do in other countries, uh, as the decision is prepared, there is an interaction ab about uh, the uh, uh, preparation of the decision, then they make this decision so that all of us and the citizens of Ukraine uh, would be sure that these decisions are legal. And in terms of the sociology polls, 87% of Ukrainians believe that it's necessary to establish a state oversight over the legality of the decisions of the local governments. That's not what I said, it's the poll and it's the citizens of Ukraine. Thank you. And Igor Kolyushko, your final comment. Yeah, thank you. Actually, the issue of the relationship uh, between uh, the state and the local governments is very important, is a very important component of this reform. And um, we're kind of getting to some constructive agreement of how that should all work. Uh, I'd like to remind you that uh, when we talk about decentralization, objectively, we want to decentralize the powers and the finances, but we only decentralize corruption, we decentralize uh, crime, and we decentralize a lot of other things. But if the state is uh, not active here, the citizens will be much worse after the decentralization in certain areas of this country than before. We don't have the right to allow that. Decentralization should enable the citizens to become responsible for their lives, but where certain local princes uh, or feudal, uh, um, feudal relationships have uh, been established, it's it's there that the state should the, where the state should be engaged and should make a difference. Um, also, uh, the next stage in the development of the local governments, uh, local governance, uh, is to reinforce uh, the instruments of uh, uh, democratic participation, such as the local referenda, the polls, uh, the role of uh, uh, the. Um, the, the the charters of the the, the statutes uh, uh, the um, um, assemblies of citizens uh, in the places of residence so, so this is how we can uh, learn to manage and organize our lives based on the democratic uh, 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 rules and uh, the rule of law yeah um, it's a very important topic for all Ukraine uh, and uh, you have mentioned resistance there is no resistance uh, there is no opposition between the mayors and the central power central government uh, 
uh, in uh, on Monday, we had a meeting with Prime Minister. Uh, tomorrow, Schmigal is initiating a similar meeting. Uh, there are issues of different vision of, 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 the, of the tools um, because the central um, uh, um, authorities should execute the, these decisions. But every mayor understands the weight of uh, citizens, citizens' lives and how he should support the businesses. We are holding a dialogue. So there is no opposition. There was a splash of dissatisfaction, and you saw this in the in Parliament yesterday, when certain things were uh, uh, disagreed upon and uh, we couldn't reach the effect, and we'll be talking about it tomorrow. We, we want to get this trust with the central power, and it's very important. If there is trust between all the branches of power, any reform will be possible and will solve the problem of oversight and so on and so forth because the whole country is uh, is 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 uh, closely looking at the problem of the weekend quarantine and now the government is is trying to solve the problem for the citizens and the businesses thank you very much colleagues uh, thank you for this um, panel discussion uh, I, I, i'd like to make a conclusion and uh, we could agree that the reform of decentralization or the reform of central uh, governance is one of the most successful reforms in ukraine that has some concrete results um, and we can uh, feel it to the government, the parliament, uh, and the experts, and the hermadas can feel that, and the polls uh, um, uh, argue, uh, uh, the polls also um, uh, speak uh, for that, and that can efficiently help develop the hermadas. The process should be transparent and funded, which is a key point. And uh, the third point is that uh, an oversight should be an assistance to the local uh, uh, governance uh, um, uh, in terms of making the right decisions, legal decisions. Uh, and the final point is that now it's important to continue to build trust between the local uh, governance, the uh, state authorities, and the next stage of the reform, what Mr. Kolyushka has said, to introduce as a stable principle, as a tradition, uh, the engagement of uh, residents in decision making so that every um, representative of the community would feel that uh, uh, he or she has the powers and uh, uh, can make decisions and can um, be engaged in uh, the decision making. Thank you very much for your uh, uh, speeches and comments. I hope that after some time, when we hold the next conference, we'll be saying that another stage has uh, completed. We have a new stage of the reform, and this reform will become the success story uh, where our foreign partners will be able to share, uh, maybe in their respective nations, uh, uh, on how quickly one can uh, <coughs> introduce reforms. Thank you very much. Our next panel will be on public administration. So I encourage all of you to stay online. And after the break, we will be discussing the reform of public administration. Thank you all for your attention.
Починаємо, так? Вітаю, колеги, вітаю, глядачі, шановні. У нас uh, зараз... Welcome, colleagues, we're dear uh, viewers. We have a, a panel on the reform of the uh, system of public administration. First, I will uh, mention the uh, speakers of the panel, which is Alexander uh, Kornienko, um, who is a member of parliament, uh, the head of the subcommittee on the uh, organization of state uh, power. Natalia Alushina, who is the head of the National Agency of Civil Service. Igor Kolyushka, who is the head of the Center for Political and Legal Reforms. Viktor Tomashuk, who is the deputy head of the Center for Political and Legal Reforms. And we have two online participants. Roman Kobet, who is an BRDO uh, expert. And Tatyana Kovtun, who is the deputy secretary, uh, state secretary of the cabinet of ministers of Ukraine. So let me kick off from an episode when in June of uh, 2016, the government approved the strategy uh, uh, of the reform of public administration. Uh, an, an international expert, uh, Gregor Virint, who is now head of the Sigma project said, um, if by 2020, and the first version of the strategy uh, was aimed uh, uh, until 2020, uh, Ukraine manages to uh, execute all the strategy points, I can guarantee you at 25 percent that in 2020 Ukraine will have uh, an efficient and transparent uh, system of uh, executive power and a system of public administration. And 2020 is almost over and we have what we have. And um, that's what we're going to discuss now. The first question is to Mr. Member of Parliament, Alexander Kornienko. According to the majority of experts, the reform of public administration has uh, uh, slowed down and actually stepped back uh, on some points. Uh, last September, the amendments uh, in the law on civil service, the so-called political dismissals were introduced, where by the new government, as soon as uh, it comes to power, they can dismiss category A civil servants without any uh, reasons um, under the pretext of a quarantine or uh, this uh, um, in September, uh, some out of competition appointments to the civil service can um, were also introduced in the parliament. Um, a very important law uh, is suspended on the uh, administrative procedure. We discussed uh, it with uh, uh, Victor. Um, now the procedure is more or less okay, but uh, because it's the, the third time that uh, it's uh, submitted to the cabinet of ministers, it's been ready for about 10 years and it's the third submittal, submission to the Verkhovna Rada. We've, this legislators have missed out the law on public consultations. Uh, for some reason, which uh, was submitted to the previous Rekhonorada, it never made its way to the voting. So not only do we have problems with the efficiency of the state power and public administration, the conditions of funding of the reforms from the Europeans and the uh, International Monetary Fund envisage the introduction of the reform of public administration and the competition procedures envisaged by the strategy. So the question to you is as follows. Uh, you, as the representatives of the, of, the, of the power, how is the current power going to solve these problems? When will these laws be passed? And when will the public administration reform be completed, which is envisaged by the strategy of the reform of public administration? Thank you for your question. Welcome everybody who's uh, watching us. Unfortunately, we can't uh, see you live because of the quarantine. For this reason also, we have some delays. We have to recognize that on the key tracks of the reform um, of uh, uh, the um, public administration, which 
um, has been agreed with the, the international partners and which are aimed uh, at at um, streamlining the civil service of Ukraine to the dynamic uh, status uh, um, according to the European uh, uh, format. Uh, and this is why we also have this delay with the competitions. We made an attempt to uh, resume the competitions. Uh, we have to take that into account. The, the, the 3491 draft law that is devoted to uh, the uh, candidates, the formation of candidates, and we've added there the provisions on the resumption of uh, the competitions. Uh, uh, the president uh, vetoed it, and the uh, Bakhon Rada did manage to override the veto. So here I'd like to um, uh, point out um, uh, to, an, uh, to a pro proposal that the reform of the public administration is the reform that requires uh, the uh, engagement of various political forces. And oftentimes, uh, the Verkhovna Rada needs some elements of the political consensus, um, where the uh, civil society, uh, which has contacts uh, with various political forces and our international partners that represent various political forces as they contact us and uh, as they are, uh, have some expectations of us, they shouldn't miss out to other forces in parliament when it comes to the public administration uh, uh, projects, they argue that it's a matter of the majority. I can count uh, uh, MPs in fingers uh, from other factions who help us in doing in promoting that reform. So such under such circumstances, I shouldn't really complain about others, but that's the fact. With regards to the key projects which have been delayed uh, delayed or, or uh, have been frozen, we continue to work with the cabinet uh, on the resumption of the competitions. Maybe Ms. Natalia is going to give her answers to us, but um, uh, we've uh, did some mathematical calculations. Mr. Serhi was uh, part of that uh, commission. I'm also a member of the commission uh, on the higher call. So we did some math and we re realized that uh, uh, we need half a year for the interviews. And especially as uh, 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 the number of candidates on average will be about 10 to 12 uh, per position. You remember the competitions for the state uh, uh, fishery, um, uh, that was 15 or 30, 15 to 30 candidates. Mm, so, you know, the expectations to hold interviews for another six months is, 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 is quite problematic for the country. So we should be looking at some mechanisms um, of how we could launch this process because we have the understanding that um, the fact that in March we planned to complete this process until May or June. Now it's December. I think we've really delayed the process. And this delay is taking place not just uh, with the category A uh, civil servants. Uh, the state secretaries uh, 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 reform professionals, not, not, not reform specialists, okay, that's category B, so, so the high, or the uh, higher category B, but the appointment of uh, the quarantine positions uh, uh, out, of, out of the competition uh, took place at uh, the uh, levels B and level C. So that's a problem because they, are, they exceed the number of 10,000 at the uh, competitions that will need to take place. Uh, uh, certain officials uh, uh, from uh, the, will, will be formed into a commission that will also take half a year. They will not be execute, executing their functions because they will have to be involved in the competitions on the spot. Uh, the National Agency for Prevention of Corruption doesn't uh, give us any hope either. We still don't realize how we can govern the practical issue of special inspections, although um, 
we realized that uh, um, this this actually doesn't doesn't make us happy. Uh, so if we talk uh, about the competition, uh, I have a hope that by the new year we will bring uh, into the uh, um, uh, Verkhon Rada a new bill uh, to resume the competitions, but depending on the capabilities of the National Agency for Civil Service and the, the uh, managers of uh, the National Agency, so that we could realistically conduct that. And not to to to, to avoid uh, um, the um, the tonnage of uh, suits in court, uh, because that actually can can bring about a lot of um, uh, court claims. Um, and a second tactical issue in this draft law is is the abolition of Article 87, the political dismissals. Uh, and we have seen that the expectations uh, uh, from this mechanism have been exaggerated. Uh, and both the political appointments and uh, competition-based uh, appointments in the long run will anyway lead to the fact that uh, the uh, work of an official is is evaluated is assessed uh, equally so it, it, we have this in the draft law and i think we'll retain it there and we'll go back to the previous model that we used to have uh, in the law on the civil service in general with regards to the reform Uh, we had a very reform-like government, and whenever you have a, a fast pace of reforms, there's always a request to the a request for some quick uh, appointments or, or quick dismissals, and sometimes that is detrimental to the institutional memory. But in the political political situation. A year ago, we can't, we couldn't really do something else because the society was expecting the cleansing, the cleansing of some centralized uh, system that uh, turned into some uh, horror movies for children, uh, such as the state cadaster, state land cadaster. Then. Uh, when we changed the government, the subsequent government uh, approached more responsibly to the reforms, and uh, and uh, they attempted to uh, submit a draft law uh, on the amendments uh, to the law on the civil service. We are currently working to make a. a an MP version of it, because um, members of parliament uh, vote better for the MP versions of the laws uh, for some reason, but uh, uh, but it will st still be within the reform. Uh, but if we deviate uh, from the quarantine story, I don't think it's a, really a step back, as some argue, in the reform of the public administration. It's just a deviation sideways because you can come back to any path uh, to the main road. The main road is clear and is approved by the indicators. We've been observing them constantly, the increase in transparency, all other principles that we all understand in order for the, the, the public administration to be formed. Um, it's important that this week we had a committee hearing, uh, which was very successful. We had a very professional discussion of the reform of um, remuneration, but this, the subject was the reform of remuneration. But 
we expanded the discussion and it was on the social conditions and the remuneration and the various conditions and the, uh, uh, of uh, civil servants and the reform of the public administration through the reform of the system of remuneration because we realized that there is no other way here um, this may not be very popular but uh, but to, to in to to increase the remuneration fund will have to make civil servants redundant we have to reduce them so uh, and the and the local governments have to uh, look for alternatives for them y yesterday in the 3651 draft uh, uh, on the formation of uh, state rayon administrations we uh, included this um, uh, amendment uh, where the civil servants uh, that are employed at the state rayon administrations they will now be dismissed they um, can be employed uh, at uh, the local uh, governments, uh, uh, like uh, local uh, self-government bodies, um, uh, with the respective uh, to the respective positions, I think about sixty percent of them can actually be um, transferred. So, if we find such compensators uh, in other sectors, maybe in the education or the law enforcement uh, sector. Uh, th there's a problem with HR in all the sectors and the, and the public administration can become such a, a, an HR supplier. So these are compensators uh, which we should consider when we are talking about the reform of the civil service. And it's not the idea only of, uh, from the MPs, but also of, uh, from uh, the side of the common people that the structure how it will be functioning and also the conditions uh, of, uh, of work and also the compensation some bonuses and so on it's important and we should talk about it because oh, what we have heard several times uh, this year that in the triangle of experts, uh, officials, uh, and parliament and the civil servants, we uh, were collaborating experts with the parliament, but not with the civil servants themselves. But uh, of course, uh, we should collaborate with the trade unions uh, because they usually know what uh, they represent. Uh, and if we include them into the decision uh, taking process, it's much better for everyone. So uh, about the plans, how we're going to move forward, we hope that uh, in the nearest uh, quarter, uh, our goal will be to uh, get back uh, from the uh, roundabout to, to the straight um, highway. It will be an attempt uh, to uh, adopt the law on uh, the uh, procedure. It would be a political compromise, in fact. Uh, then we should try to take steps on the registration of the draft law uh, on uh, the uh, salary grid and if we are speaking about the renewal of competitions then they should be renewed in the way to be functionable but not uh, to be formal so it shouldn't be the case that uh, we renewed them but they cannot uh, function i think that in March, we will check where uh, we have moved to. There is a, an in external also condition, uh, such as a pandemic situation, because we are not sure uh, whether the parliament will uh, be functioning uh, in the proper way, but still we have to adopt the budget and a number of laws are to be adopted. In January, 
we know how uh, our state is functioning due to the holidays so we only have february and march and part of uh, december in the parliament uh, to adopt the, this um, uh, and we uh, are quite proactive in our committee and as mr uh, sergey mentioned we have a subcommittee of uh, state uh, service and uh, uh, of course, uh, that uh, uh, the main uh, area uh, where we are focused are state uh, civil service, uh, and we have uh, have uh, a number of initiatives from MPs. We have collected them when we had uh, the committee uh, meeting, and uh, there were around 30 draft laws were uh, submitted on uh, the uh, salary agreed, and uh, part of them included these uh, civil servants. There are uh, draft laws on uh, the um, uh, age limit uh, for the civil servants, and we are collecting uh, those uh, draft laws in one committee to have a com uh, comprehensive approach. Miss Natalia, question to you. What's your vision about the uh, reform you are the head and uh, you are forming the policy uh, on the civil service? And uh, the second question is the pressing point about the salary uh, for the state, uh, so for the civil service. Uh, on one hand, uh, we have this knowledge uh, that uh, the salaries uh, in the uh, civil servants uh, are quite uh, low. Then we know that from uh, 2016, uh, the salary fund increased up to 40 million. So when the payment uh, of uh, the uh, um, salary or, or salaries of the um, civil servants will be dependent uh, on their performance. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Sergei. Uh, I will not be quite original if we, if I start speaking uh, about the issues which we have at the civil service. But a number of experts and international experts, um, and also the national experts. Uh, articulating uh, the topic uh, such as uh, uh, pressing issues in the, the reform of the civil service. Uh, we are solving some uh, issues step by step. Mr. Sam mentioned about uh, 30 or 491. Even if it will be adopted, it will not solve all uh, the issues. Unfortunately, the comprehensive law uh, 48 uh, was rejected. Now, we still have those pressing points uh, which were included in this draft law, and we have to move forward. The civil service should be based uh, uh, on the Sigma principles and uh, the meritocratic uh, principles, performance-based uh, uh, salaries should be improved, uh, introduced and uh, the level of, of uh, salaries uh, and bonus uh, should uh, be linked uh, to their performance. If nothing uh, will be changed, there will be no mistakes. So no one can find the ideal solution uh, which uh, will be sure without mistakes. We have uh, to take into consideration uh, good analytics, um, expertise uh, from international experts, from our European colleagues. The issue uh, which you articulated about the system uh, of uh, salary grades, uh, we should be very cautious about the payment uh, to civil servants to define how we are moving uh, this uh, reform of civil service, uh, we should also consider um, the decisions uh, of the committee um, 
and you can see the video on YouTube or uh, in Facebook um, and on website of Verkhovna Rada. It's a very sensitive uh, issue and uh, not only civil servants are interested and anxious about it. So we shouldn't uh, be uh, we shouldn't be talking uh, about some uh, topics uh, such as uh, why we should have this high number of civil servants. We should uh, decrease the number of them, but uh, we have uh, to uh, discuss also whether uh, they started uh, performing better when their salaries increased uh, three times. So they used to receive 1,232 grivnas, 1,338 uh, 1, uh, grivnas was the minimal salary uh, of the civil servants. So, and what about the salaries for now? The minimal allowance uh, for living uh, is uh, 2,198, and for the civil servant is uh, two um, uh, minimal uh, living allowances. So uh, the salary could be uh, 4,000. So the minimal salary of civil servant is uh, 4,394 grivnas. And I should indicate that uh, on November 2020, uh, the salary uh, is uh, 5,000 grivnas. And it's uh, lower than uh, the minimal stage, uh, minimal salary in Ukraine. In Ukraine, uh, minimal salary in Ukraine uh, should be 6,000 grivnas. So the uh, civil servants uh, have 4,394 uh, grivnas. So it's a very sensitive uh, issue, um, especially for regional uh, levels. And uh, this gap uh, in uh, five uh, years increased a lot. So you were asking how much uh, the efficiency uh, of uh, the performance of civil servants increased. Now we are evaluating this. We are doing this at the beginning of, of the year. So we are setting uh, the goals. And then from uh, the 1st of October, the assessment starts, evaluation starts. And now we uh, are say, uh, watching uh, whether we have achieved uh, the tasks which were set in January. Uh, all of us uh, are victims uh, of uh, the um, uh, pandemic situation uh, all around the world, but the efficiency of uh, the civil service uh, did not decrease. I would like to highlight that one of the priorities for now of the reform of the civil service, and you also mentioned this at the beginning, uh, that on the uh, 24th uh, of June 2016, the concept was adopted. And we should also recollect that the uh, system of um, salaries for civil servants uh, had to be changed. And in uh, May, uh, the concept of the uh, amendments to the system of payment was adopted. We also have uh, the, uh, the decree uh, on the classification of uh, position in civil service was adopted in uh, this uh, state uh, agency on civil servants. Now they are uh, the Ministry of Justice uh, is considering uh, how uh, this classification is in line with the legislation. So we are now having the, the models, uh, the piloting um, 
of those salary degrees in four uh, ministries uh, in uh, the ministry of uh, finance the state agency of civil servant the ministry of digital transformation so after the pilots are uh, will finish then we'll submit to the cabinet of ministers uh, the analysis of uh, those pilots then uh, when we have the uh, outcomes so we uh, we will uh, have the possibility to uh, calculate um, uh, on the basis of uh, this analysis the new system uh, so but then the next step is uh, to compare with the market salaries uh, and after this uh, we could uh, we will introduce the grade so we cannot uh, introduce uh, the complete change of a system of payment uh, in one turn uh, or even uh, in one month and i'm very thankful to the committee for having uh, this uh, hearings uh, on uh, the changes in the payment uh, system and the draft law was submitted where those uh, pressing points are indicated and we do hope uh, that we will move forward and uh, the system of paint will be reformed. It's a very socially sensible uh, point. I have a additional um, question about the bonuses. In 2016, when uh, the legislation on civil service was adopted and there was a transition provision for two years that the uh, head uh, of the unit uh, can allocate uh, the bonuses uh, for 300 percent of the salary or someone will not receive nothing it will be the at the discretion of the head but the, this provision was not uh, uh, transitional it became uh, an eternal one so it's an additional tool for the head of the state institution uh, to uh, stimulate uh, those loyal to him or her uh, and also to punish uh, those who are not loyal. So when uh, the uh, fair bonus system will be introduced, so if uh, this results-based uh, approach will be introduced, I'm very thankful sorry, that in the draft law, it was foreseen uh, about this sensitive issue. The draft law foresees that the bonuses uh, will be allocated once uh, per three months. It will be a quarter bonus. Because if uh, we uh, receive uh, this uh, bonus every month, then the civil servants uh, perceive it uh, as uh, a normal salary. So uh, the bonus could be up to 90%, uh, but uh, up uh, to 90%, but only once in three months. So this uh, remuneration uh, system uh, will foresee two parts. Uh, there is a fixed part which is 70 percent and uh, the variable one that's 30 percent uh, that's what we call the bonus but also i'd like to highlight here that uh, on the basis of the evaluation of performance uh, of the civil servants and also uh, it's foreseen that the bonuses can be allocated uh, up to uh, three uh, salaries. So uh, this provision is included in this draft law. Thus, without the adoption of law, we will not have the possibility to move forward. It's a very sensitive one, and we are articulating it uh, uh, very intensively. And it's a pressing issue that uh, the civil servants should be supported because we are losing the civil service and uh, this work, uh, unfortunately, uh, that the change, uh, constant change of employees. I also heard uh, a number of claims from the civil uh, servants uh, that uh, the uh, 
those who are superior are usually neglecting uh, the regulations and uh, now acting very bossy. We have uh, this uh, bonus uh, uh, system can become a bottleneck uh, of the remuneration system. We have to communicate to people uh, what will be uh, happening, because now it looks for them like uh, a, num a huge part uh, of their remuneration uh, will be taken away. For example, uh, for the middle range uh, servants, it's an important part of their uh, remuneration and no one understands uh, how uh, it will function further. I think that the, the point of uh, communication uh, is uh, uh, very important. Um, and uh, I do believe uh, the, that um, uh, in uh, uh, Verkhovna uh, uh, Rada, we have to discuss uh, all the, the small aspects. Uh, this uh, lockdown story uh, with this um, maximum uh, ceiling of uh, remuneration. Nothing, uh, it was not a huge uh, uh, problem, but we saw that There were a lot of talkings uh, that new people are not willing to join the civil service. So we're losing this tempo of the reform. So those uh, open-minded uh, business people are not joining the civil service. Uh, so no one is willing to join uh, right now from uh, and uh, they are saying that if you will fix uh, this remuneration for a specified period so when they are coming from uh, business uh, for them, it's uh, not logical uh, to uh, come uh, to uh, the civil service where they have uh, this very low uh, remuneration. Uh, so it's true that it's a very sensitive uh, issue to communicate uh, with those uh, bonuses and uh, the adequate remuneration for a high level uh, officials uh, for, uh, to have the possibility to invite people from business. Uh, the next uh, question is, uh, goes to Tatiana Kovdun, who is online with us. Uh, so we started uh, discussing the new strategy now of uh, the civil service reform for 2022. I would like to come back to the current uh, strategy, which was uh, first um, adopted till uh, 2020 and then prolonged till 2021. Uh, how successful this uh, reform uh, was? Uh, we also discussed uh, the topics which should be included in the next uh, strategy. So it looks like uh, we are a second uh, a year, uh, year students. So uh, it looks like we're going to learn the alphabet uh, again. So do you consider uh, the civil service reform a successful one? Could you please uh, name uh, what are the main factors of why we did not succeed in everything? Uh, thanks, dear colleagues, for organizing this event. It's uh, very good to see that uh, there is uh, a huge interest in the reform of uh, civil service. We should be quite objective assessing ourselves. 
I have sometimes the feeling that we failed in, in everything and the reform of civil service failed and uh, it sometimes also have the feeling that we are hearing the second uh, for the second time the third uh, year in school but if we compare with uh, different countries all over the world the uh, reform of public administration is always a uh, long time taking uh, history so we are comparing with the uk with uh, canada with sweden they have been reforming the public administration for decades. So there's testing the new systems uh, of uh, position. And we have the media of uh, state uh, building public governance committee. And uh, they're sharing uh, ideas between all, all, all the countries how to improve the system of public administration. It's a complicated process. It's sort of a like a reconstruction of a plane while it's flying. So it's quite a complicated process. The big challenge is the, the consensus uh, the lack of consensus in the society and between the elites, what means the good governance? And we can name a number of issues about the remuneration, about the competition, about the career promotion, about the open competition to all the positions, the experts on the reforms which had very different opinions about its efficiency. Another challenge is the capacity of the civil service. We have already a tradition and political dependence inside the civil service. There is no internal communication. So the culture of internal communication should be changed and it cannot happen in one year. We can see that the state secretaries um, uh, were established at the uh, beginning of the 2017. Uh, then they, uh, the directorates uh, appeared in 2018. They were not formed in full, and uh, we have uh, some going back uh, process. It's not enough to have the legislative framework. But as Mr. Alexander mentioned uh, in the legislation, uh, for example, the uh, draft law 3491 uh, and uh, that it was vetoed and the veto uh, was not um, overcome. So this uh, lockdown uh, appointments uh, for some people are very convenient and uh, some very professional people appeared uh, at the civil service. But that's uh, also the issue of some procedures and uh, some uh, processes. Mr. Sergei, I would like to say that we cannot say that, uh, that the reform uh, failed completely. Uh, as we are assessing uh, the uh, reform uh, annually, and uh, we do it with the, the assessment of statesmen, and we have around 60-70% uh, uh, of uh, uh, what we have achieved. 75% uh, for the last uh, years of fulfillment. As for the reform of digitalization and services, we are moving with a good pace and uh, we are even forward, moving forward uh, for the tasks which we have set for us, uh, for ourselves. The reform uh, of the remuneration system has a very low grade, but uh, on other aspects, uh, we received a high grade uh, comparing to uh, other countries or candidates uh, for uh, the membership in the EU. For example, the transparency of uh, policy forming on the index of, of the World Economic Forum. 
it's good uh, it's the best uh, biggest positive uh, fact is that uh, almost a lot of people uh, know of what are the uh, standards of Sigma. We didn't uh, have a career UA where we can see all uh, the positions uh, open uh, to everyone. And now we are working on the renewal of the strategy and we are involving everyone to this drafting. So we have to solve a number of political issues and we should have a consensus about them. We should uh, continue moving forward. Thank you for the possibility to talk to you. Two years ago, we had a discussion with um, UK experts. Uh, we uh, were telling uh, that uh, our reform uh, hasn't uh, achieved the results which we were aiming uh, to, but we have been reforming our system, answered uh, the UK expert, for 40 years. So the next question uh, goes to the civil servant. Uh, now we have a question to the uh, public sector. Mr. Ehir, what is your vision of this reform? Uh, that's the first question. And the second question is, in 2015, 2016, the public sector and the public experts played a key role in preparing and promotion of uh, the laws on the civil service and the strategy of the reform and other sub laws. Don't you think that today the cooperation uh, between the power and the, and the public sector has uh, weakened? And another question, why? are public activists not willing to uh, to actually join the power? They are not welcome there or they're not willing to? Thank you for your question. There are um, a lot of questions based on the schedule. Uh, I'll start from the key points, what we call an administrative reform in, in the world. In this country, we make a division into two parts. There's a ref separate reform of the local governments, uh, and there is a reform of uh, uh, governance. So we were discussing the first reform at the first panel, and we stated there that thanks to the fact that, despite the fact that the power has changed, There was a recognition and the execution of the uh, concept of the reform. We can speak of the uh, achievements in the reform of uh, the self-governance and territorial organization of power. And I'm contemplating here, and I can't say that with the change of power in 2019, we had had a, a conceptual drawback. The the strategy which was uh, adopted uh, is still uh, valid and the new power recognizes it and is exercising it, but uh, there is less success. It's less successful. And uh, speaking of the reasons, I come to a conclusion that obviously the key problem of the governance uh, reform is that we uh, are not candid enough about the tasks and goals thereof. The, the reform is thought of as some technology. Let's change the payroll calculations or the procedure of appointments, or let's change something in regulations. But in fact, behind all these uh, procedural issues, we miss out the conceptual goal why in the world do we need to reform the governance? Uh, and it is because the government as the power should serve the interests of the uh, society and uh, provide for the sustainable development of the nation. We have to form the policy and uh, make the policy and uh, implement it. And oftentimes behind the trees, we can't see the forest. And that's the main problem of this um, reform. As uh, I, I was preparing for this conference, I picked up the presentation which I spoke with on the 25th of February at a similar conference. It turned out that uh, um, 
half of those slides could be used and shown. Um, but uh, we've agreed that I'm not going to demonstrate uh, um, a presentation today. But if we talk about the general impression from the second half of this year, Uh, we have a different impression from the first half. Uh, back in February, we were talk talking about the fact that uh, the power has a lot of good initiatives, but uh, 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 it's uh, not active in other respects, uh, uh, no analysis of, of the policy making, uh, ignoring the rule of law and so on. As we look at the second half of the year, the general impressions are such reflections as a second government of President Zelensky is again formed not by the prime minister, but in violation of the constitution is it is formed somewhere in the presidential office, which brings us down to the fact that in the first months of this government, we see problems uh, in his relations with the parliament. We have a new term, even. Uh, um, uh, an illegally acting minister. Why in the world uh, is it so? Because in the very beginning, we didn't have the proper dialogue with the parliamentary majority um, in the course of uh, formation of the government. And because, be, because of this technology mistake, uh, we had the problems of functioning. Secondly, is that the focus of this government's attention is to the COVID-19 pandemic. This is objective. We can't get away from this. Although even here, um, we can't really brag much, but it's another discussion. Uh, in terms of the positive achievements, of the second government of Pres uh, President Zelensky is that finally an uh, old uh, commitment uh, where the draft law on the administrative procedure uh, was uh, submitted to parliament and was approved in the first uh, hearing of this. Um, and I think it's also that uh, the policy in the administrative services and the digital transformation uh, is also another success story. And Viktor Tchepashuk is gonna give us more information on that. Meanwhile, the problems of ruining of uh, the civil service that have been mentioned are recognized by the power, but are not corrected and still not corrected. Maybe uh, why and why can't they correct them is another question. The task of reforming uh, the ministries and the government identified by the uh, reform strategy are uh, understood, are uh, recognized, but are not impl implemented. So for half a year, nothing has changed here, neither in terms of the number of directorates, nor in terms of their staffing, nor in their role, nor in the uh, workflow management at the cabinet of ministers. Uh, the need uh, in the legislation uh, uh, of uh, the executive branch is recognized, is discussed, but there's no progress yet. And looking at the recommendations uh, which uh, were uh, stated on the 25th of February uh, to, the, to the cabinet of ministers uh, by us, from, from the eight points which were covered then only one was uh, implemented, which is the law on administrative procedure, and the seven other points are still um, outstanding. The discussion of the draft law on the cabinet of ministers and the central executives, uh, drafting of its version and submission to the Verkhovna Rada, the formation of directorates at all ministries according to the um, policy sectors that they're responsible for, the reduction of the number of deputy ministers, that is the recommendation, that's a standing recommendation, to prepare a new law on the uh, amendments 
to the law on the civil service to correct the law mistakes which were made in 2019. Uh, transparent and um, uh, fair competitions of the civil service uh, uh, to follow the commitments uh, in uh, in at uh, the centers of administrative services to eliminate alternative forms of their provision and to submit to the Verkhovna Rada a draft law on the administrative theme. So all of these seven points are still outstanding uh, from last uh, uh, year. And uh, a few more words about drafting of a new strategy of the governance reform. I think this is the uh, new, the, no the novelty that has just emerged. Mr. Sarhi has uh, stated that we haven't executed the previous strategy. Why are we drafting a new one? Um, it makes sense to draft a new strategy and it's good that the government has uh, uh, decided to do so, but the success of the story will depend on whether we go the same way because uh, the government stated uh, previously uh, as um, um, few commitments as possible to uh, to technologize them. If we go that way, uh, nothing is going to change. I think that the new strategy should be uh, substantially different from the previous one, and that uh, difference should be uh, within the next sectors. So the strategy should demonstrate a vision of the general system of governance with which we would like uh, to join EU and NATO according to the provisions of the Ukrainian constitution. If in 2016, as we drafted the previous strategy, we didn't have such provisions in the constitution, nor such commitments uh, in front of us. We have them now, so let's comply with them. And, and these are uh, new requirements uh, and in terms of the governance. Number two, the strategy should be based on the Sigma recommendations, not just stipulated in 2017, but uh, of a lot of previous recommendations which have not been executed. Uh, discussions of uh, uh, the uh, plans of drafting um, of a new strategy with the, the general public is very good, but it's important to account for the expert recommendations. And I don't know how these uh, recommendations will be accounted for. Next, we have to uh, refuse from We have to include a minimum in the strategy to be better accountable. Um, we have to timely formulate in the strategy the conditions according to which it has a chance to be executed. That's about the constitutional role of the government. It has to be formulated and uh, uh, complied with rather than say, okay, that's what the president wanted. That's what the MPs wanted. We have a constitution which gives us an answer to what is the government and what, should, and what it should do. Next is the leadership of the prime minister. Without this factor, it's a, we can't have a success story in the reform of the cabinet of ministers. And it is the prime minister personally who should uh, chair the reform of the cabinet ministers. And of course, we have to support the president of the parliament. Without these factors, we won't be able to attain success. And the last but not least is to, to engage external experts. Uh, to the drafting of the strategy, both uh, uh, Ukrainian and international recommended by EU. And why um, NGO experts don't want to join us? Uh, there are different reasons. Uh, when I was requested, to, am I prepared to uh, get a position in government um, with a scope of skills with the, uh, the certain achievements that doesn't actually incentivize me to go to some narrow position. I would like to realize the scope of achievements which, which I have in the last 20 years in this sector. So I'm, I was, uh, 
prepared to take a certain position, but politically these issues have never been resolved. More so, I don't see a problem uh, there. It doesn't matter whether any of the experts will take a certain position. Um, I and other, a lot of other experts are prepared to work without any positions. It's important, important for us to have a dialogue, to have a political will to exercise these reforms. We're prepared to help anybody, especially the younger experts uh, who have better uh, education than us for this reform to be implemented. Thank you. Um, it's also a question about the sustainability of the reform and the strategy, because uh, one, a government uh, thinks about the reforms, then the, the government uh, changes, and then another government is implementing it. So here, the positions of state secretaries should have ensured the sustainability of those reforms and the strategy. But unfortunately, like Tatiana said, that uh, uh, a lot of these positions have been vacated and we can't really follow the sustainability here. So how do we ensure sustainability of the next strategy? Uh, so our next question is to Victor. Victor is a renounced expert in the provision of administrative services. First of all, this the issue of reforms in public administration, public administration is one of the most successful ones. Which major achievements in the sector of administrative services provision can you note? If any, and which are the key drivers of success? Thank you, Serhi. I think I'm going to keep the intrigue of the success story, but I was happy to speak with uh, Alexander Kornienko. I think it's the third such opportunity in this uh, uh, opportunity this year, and I'd like to make some emphases here. Out of all the problems that we've discussed today, we have to clearly articulate one, which is the law on civil um, service. It was not really a detour road. Um, it's a, a major rollback. I think we've lost several years. We've lost millions of billions of grivenas. Uh, I understand the political motives uh, of the power that has come, um, of the party that has come to power, but uh, we, that it, that it is quite debatable. Um, it's a matter of a stable professional civil service, which has uh, uh, been uh, challenged and it has impacted the system of public administration. I am happy to hear the politicians finally admit uh, and recognize this uh, a problem, which must be corrected, but it must be corrected as soon as possible because our system of public administration is a major, um, a major bottleneck. Um, and the, the state cannot function like this anymore. It's also a very dangerous precedent, which was manifested when the draft law uh, 3748 was voted on, because all the factions voted against this draft, not just the servant of the people faction. Uh, all the factions, the pro-Ukrainian factions, did not give a single vote. Um, why? Maybe the politicians know better. If the if President Zelensky uh, took advantage of the political dismissals and will also come to power, we may also be involved in this HR policy. And on, on these conditions, the state cannot function. That's the first statement. The second statement is that uh, what Alexand Mr. Alexander said, it's, and with, we had a discussion with Sergei Soroka, we've been discussing this for five years. I don't think it's right to engage people from the business sector in the um, a public sector as a panacea. We have to understand the, the public governance is another system. We have to develop and grow the right uh, civil servants. Let the business people come, but uh, public administration is an, uh, uh, um, an evolutionary and uh, sustainable process. So, uh, we had to continue the right policy. Uh, rather than uh, completely 
break that down. Uh, also, we have to understand the values of the civil service and its rules. Uh, and I think uh, there is a difference in opinions uh, among the experts. And if the politicians don't have a common strategic view on this matter, this law will never be stable and the system will never be stable with regards to the civil service. Um, with regards to the local governments, because of the lack uh, of the consistent uh, government policy, the law has not been passed. The draft law was um, prepared very well, uh, politically with the Association of uh, Cities, and we have a lot of messages now. Well, the new managers uh, were appointed and they want to surround their people around them. So we're losing the potential, and that's the second task um, which must be fulfilled by Mr. Alexandre as the head of the subcommittee, even though he also chairs the party. We have to correct these two laws. Uh, in, in terms of the advantages and disadvantages, um, the law on the administrative procedure will be a big advantage to the new power because it's been 20 years, sorry, not two years or five years. Uh, we've had the story with uh, the law on the administrative procedure, procedure for 20 years and the fact that it was passed in the first reading. It's a great progress for the development of our, governan uh, our governance system. We have uh, the working group is 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 working now, and um, and uh, the committee for self governance uh, is uh, making good progress there. So there's pretty good work going on, and it's unlikely that this law will be passed this year, but in early next year, hopefully, as long as the interfactionary support is maintained, and we have to retain it. Another draft law mentioned uh, by Sir here on the public consultations was also submitted to the parliament. It is hot, it's a priority, but it's simple and can improve uh, uh, the government policy uh, because it's impossible to have any policies without the engagement of uh, stakeholders. So there must be a minimum uh, process of consultations. And this draft law can be passed as long as there is a political decision in the previous uh, parliament because the uh, MPs did not want to and do it themselves previously. And we have to answer, why has the administrative services reform been successful? Because it's a lengthy reform. It started in 2008, we had the, the first snub. Then 2011, the law on administrative services. 2014, uh, Vice Premier Roisman, and then the Roisman's government made two important decisions. on. The, on the list of services for snubs, where uh, all um, the services were included in snubs and the decentralization of the three groups of powers, the registration of residence, uh, res registration of uh, your property and uh, of your business. But it's important that this policy is in the hands of the local governments. Uh, when we, whenever we talk about snubs, I've, according to the law, we have 180 uh, amalgamated committees that were obliged to create SNAPs, uh, uh, but a, an additional of, uh, 300 amalgamated committees, communities have created them. So a lot of uh, uh, such um, uh, areas uh, have uh, done this um, out of their initiative. So 91% of visitors are happy with the SNAPs and 2% are not happy and 95% are happy with the competence of the staff in the SNAPs. So that is a positive reform, although in the last year and a half with the new power, a lot of things have not taken place, uh, which must have uh, been done. For instance, decentralization among the administrative uh, services will have problems um, to, with regards to the registration of the civil status, uh, what Igor was saying, the issue of money uh, has uh, uh, not yet been streamlined. Uh, also uh, have uh, the Ministry of Interior where, uh, where there's uh, uncontrolled uh, uh, billions coming in. So, but the recipe of su success is the con is co consistency of uh, the policy and the length of the policy. And we have to trust uh, our local governments more. Uh, yeah, with regards to the two laws that have been mentioned on the public consultations, unfortunately, we've come 
to a political deep discussion uh, debate because we have two laws on lobbying which are perceived as the element of a broader discussion a broader debate there's an initi initiative uh, group which will be active soon which constitutional amendments do they want to lobby on the consultations and hopefully we'll uh, work that out next year uh, I think it will be another committee, the Committee for Legal Policy, that will be working on that. Because the new law on political parties is governed by, uh, is managed by that committee. Our subcommittee, uh, as part of the decentralization package, uh, identified a priority of laws. And the biggest emergency is NDA to start some oversight Next is uh, the self-governance. Uh, Dmitry Gurin is uh, doing this publicly. And the next step uh, is the service. Um, and actually, it has to do with two laws, uh, the law on civil service and the, uh, the law on self-governance. Um, and I think it's the plan for the next year. And I think we'll complete that. Uh, next year and I think the political process will be over by then and be because right now they won't allow us uh, to pass anything because everybody has uh, deputies uh, everybody wants uh, to dismiss the, the old staff so it's a, a politically difficult law to pass now but as soon as the process is uh, over by spring and everyone will find a job. I think uh, we can do this within the context of other laws on decentralization. Thank you all for the professional uh, discussion. It was very useful. We have one more participant who joined us, Roman Kobetz. And by the way, um, um, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, why is the law on public consultations important? Last uh, Wednesday, the law pa uh, uh, passed uh, a decision on the introduction of the quarantine, the weekend quarantine, and the businesses could not have, didn't have, didn't have enough time to prepare for it. So the public doesn't understand why. What are the reasons? They didn't have time to prepare. So there is certain resentment to that uh, decision. I have a question to Roman. Roman, please tell me, you as a professional in the policy analysis and the policy making analysis. According to which procedure should similar decisions be made by the government or should similar laws be passed? Which should be the procedure that should precede uh, such a decision? Thank you for your question. Uh, uh, thank you for your invitation to speak at this forum, on the reform of public administration. As I go back to this example with the introduction of the weekend quarantine, we see here the substantial drawbacks of the system in decision making. The key peculiarity here is that these decisions are not grounded. We don't see the expedience thereof. Why would one have to introduce a week and quarantine uh, and uh, not to continue an adaptive quarantine, uh, which, uh, depending on the uh, level of morbidity, uh, the problems which could be solved by the adaptive quarantine will suddenly be solved by the weekend quarantine. I think it's just because of the lack of analysis analysis of the policy where you can you can uh, uh, substantiate uh, uh, your choice. Uh, these decisions should be well informed. Uh, people should understand why they have to solve certain problems and why uh, certain things should impact these problems and what could be the consequences. 
And one of the drawbacks of this reform of public administration, which we've been exercising in the seven years, is that we haven't formed the capability of the ministry, which is responsible for the policy making, to create certain information that would enable to better understand the content and the consequences for the decision makers, because there are very simple, three very simple questions which we would like to know answers to. What is being proposed to us? What will the people do? How are they going to do this? And why are they going to do this? Why are they going to do this rather than something else? In fact, only as we have information can we understand whether this decision is expedient, uh, is balanced because at least we'll understand that we will opt for a certain option. Or if we um, look at the fight with pandemic, I think there are six options. So option one is to act as we always act in a uh, condition of an epidemic. It's not the first epidemic in Ukraine. How do we respond to an epidemic? There is a certain morbidity level. There are certain quarantine uh, measures, educational factor, and so on and so on. Uh, option two is we can reject from any response well, such as Belarus did. So there will be some collective immunity. Until 85% of the population gains antibodies in the blood and until we get the vaccine. Option three, according to uh, the Swedes, let's uh, focus on the protection of people who have their higher highest risk. Uh, number option four is the full lockdown, complete lockdown. Option five is the adaptive quarantine. And option six is the weekend quarantine, which we are having now. So why did we opt for any of them? We can compare options against certain criteria. Do we want to minimize the load on the health care? Do we want to minimize the revenues to the budget? Do we want to uh, minimize the revenues of the business? Do we want to, to minimize uh, the pressure on uh, the pre psychological pressure on the people who are staying home jobless? Or any, do we want to change some administrative procedures which could be exercised? What will the society uh, take as acceptable or not? There are some criteria which we can compare and make some decisions. To do that, we have to work. We have to collect options, we have to analyze the consequences, we have to uh, survey or poll certain groups of population. A large scope of such uh, analytical work and consulting which must be conducted by the ministry and agencies and members of parliament, which have some limited resource, who have assistants who are not capable to uh, do that scope of work. Or we could deviate from that practice uh, of spontaneous intuitive decisions. Uh, and, and then we get beaten because uh, uh, such a decision has not uh, been substantiated. So there's a very big problem which remains outstanding as part of this reform is to come up with the capability of the power to accumulate information, to collect, uh, uh, to, to, to start consultations, to draft proposals for decision makers, to better understand the content and the consequences, and to also understand why this decision is better than others. So the substantiation of the experience, the balanced approach of the policy. Unfortunately, our practice of governance is very far from that, and uh, in Ukraine, we have to work towards that end better. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Would anyone like to add something?
Otherwise, thank you all for the discussion. Thank you for your answers. Thank you, dear organizers.
Вітаю всіх, доброго. Юлія Кириченко, who is also the co-chair of the RPR, Daniel Rosladislavsky, Igor Kout, is from USAID Vrada, Юлія Зайченко, from UNDP, also Петро Стецюк, scientific advisor on legal issues of the Rosumkov Center, and Olga Sovgiri, uh, MP, head of the Parliament Subcommittee on the Political Reform and Constitutional Law of the Parliament Committee on Legal Policy. So my first question uh, was uh, will be to Yulia Kirichenko on the constitutional reform and you are the co-author of this reform. Would you be so kind um, to tell us uh, more? What uh, are uh, the challenges and what are the ways uh, out? Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, our uh, panel discussion, we have uh, the topic constitutional and parliamentary reform. So um, I will dedicate my speech to constitutional reform. And we should mention that the passing year showed that there is no constitutional reform, but there were constitutional initiatives, and they are more than one year old. So they appeared unexpectedly, and they are dying out. So what happened during this year? So the political power after the presidential and parliamentary elections on the first day of the convocation of the parliament initiated seven separate draft laws on the amendments to the constitution, which became surprise both to the professional experts, but to the most MPs as well, and to the Ukrainian society as well. Uh, now we can say, in fact, we were saying this even that, that for the constitutional amendments, the process is one of the most uh, important uh, steps. And no uh, amendments to the constitution uh, uh, voted for. And uh, as an expert, uh, I am very happy about it. So seven draft laws and the constitutional court uh, uh, gave its opinion on uh, three of these uh, draft laws uh, that uh, the Article 158 uh, is uh, not uh, in compliance uh, with the disbalancing uh, of the system of uh, powers, uh, branches of power, which uh, would uh, not guarantee uh, the constitutional rights. Uh, two draft laws uh, received a positive opinion, but we can even say that uh, those draft laws are almost buried down uh, and they were voted for in January and uh, the final voting should be done on, on the uh, on the third uh, session, which is uh, over. We know about the dubious uh, decision uh, of the constitutional court that it could be any session, uh, session, uh, but we believe that the next one is, uh, should be uh, this. The following one uh, should be the next one. For example, uh, the uh, idea on the elimination of the uh, bars uh, monopoly. Uh, and uh, of course, we will uh, be saying as experts that uh, those um, uh, amendments uh, are not legal. Uh, these, uh, th there are two more draft laws uh, which can uh, become the body of the Constitution. On this fourth uh, session, the draft law which was not even considered by the parliament and 
uh, there was no preliminary approval. And the second one, the decrease uh, uh, on the number of the MPs uh, to 300. Uh, the preliminary uh, approval uh, was uh, in February. So if we look from an objective point of view, uh, the parliament uh, is not saying anything about uh, uh, voting on the amendments to the constitution, but maybe it should have been done about the um, national initiative. It can be developed further, but we should step back and in a different way uh, with the, the uh, opinions of the constitutional court, with the, the uh, different articles uh, and then coming uh, back uh, to the constitutional court and uh, then to amend the constitution. If we speak about the constitutional reform, it should have had a comprehensive approach. And our advice for today is uh, to move the, the initiative center of uh, the from the president to the parliament uh, from uh, the times of the previous presidents the administration of preparation and the secretary of the president now the office of president always were the uh, initiators and there were no successes and even the commission the assemblies uh, were uh, had uh, great value I don't know why the president, as a guarantor of uh, the constitution, uh, thinks that he or she uh, has the right uh, to initiate the amendments. And uh, from what we can see, uh, parliament has uh, most powers uh, to amend the constitution. That's why I believe that the center of the initiatives should be moved uh, to uh, the parliament and to have a comprehensive uh, uh, vision on the amendments. So for the, the decentralization uh, should uh, end up uh, uh, by the amendments to the constitution and uh, it should also uh, include the changes in the powers triangle in 2014 when we were forced to come back uh, to the constitution of uh, 2000 for the main statement was that in 2014 uh, the comprehensive amendments will be approved and when with which we should uh, strengthen the uh, parliamentary power and this task um, which was undertaken by the previous uh, power uh, was not finished, uh, not uh, even by this one, by the previous one as well. So the decentralization should uh, be looked in a comprehensive way by strengthening the parliamentary power. This commission should work with the legislation Um, and uh, it's uh, considered uh, that there are anti-constitutional uh, powers of the uh, president in a number of uh, laws, and uh, uh, these uh, laws should uh, be brought, uh, uh, should be aligned uh, with uh, the constitution. For example, the successful reforms uh, which are considered by the society as uh, successful are going uh, to the constitutional court and receive the negative uh, opinion. For example, that uh, anti-corruption uh, uh, agencies and bodies were established with violation of the uh, constitution. And that's why their creation are unconstitutional. Uh, that's why uh, the second uh, step should be a comprehensive approach to the reform and uh, there should be a uh, fundamental uh, basis 
so uh, all uh, the legal uh, tools uh, uh, will be used uh, uh, to uh, undermine uh, the efforts of uh, the um, anti-corruption institutions. Do I still have some time? So for the next year, I believe that the constitution uh, reform was not happening this year. For the next year, we should step, uh, we should make a step back and uh, to see what are the issues with the implementation of this reform, and then uh, to decide on the comprehensive measures. It should be a pan-Ukrainian constitutional process and uh, to have a, not only parliament as a unique uh, body uh, responsible for the uh, constitutional uh, amendments, but there could be a council or assembly uh, which could advise about it. And then uh, people will be included in the process of amending uh, the constitution. For the Ukrainian society, this constitution should become a value. And after this, it will become a value uh, for uh, the uh, powers. Next question to Alexander Zaslavsky. We started uh, also with the topic of the constitutional uh, reform and the steps. But at the same time, we have the reform of uh, the parliament. What's your position about uh, the uh, laws, the draft laws on uh, the uh, parliamentary uh, reform? A short answer for your question would be uh, very similar to what Yulia was saying. We should have a comprehensive vision But I will come back for a few steps. Uh, the situation in which we are now uh, started uh, with uh, the uh, presentation in 2016 uh, when the roadmap about the reform of the parliament was presented. Uh, and last year in Toronto, And there were 52 recommendations and we analyzed how many of them were implemented. And it was less than 42%. And we suggested uh, at the conference in Toronto and with the, the colleagues from the NGO, uh, we initiated uh, in front of the new MPs about the um, main steps. Uh, and uh, the reform stopped for a while. We had to review uh, those 52 recommendations because some of them uh, are not relevant anymore. Some of them were not relevant, uh, frankly speaking. We had this uh, roadmap um, and nothing else of, uh, which could be an objective for us. Um, uh, for, to my mind, um, now I think that the adoption of uh, the law on the civil uh, service and also on the um, ethics uh, on MPs. And uh, I was uh, checking uh, on the internet, whether there are uh, any codes uh, of the MPs. And I found a number of them for the local uh, MPs. And it's quite strange that there is no code uh, for uh, the members of parliament. Uh, from those recommendations uh, which we had, uh, almost uh, none of them were fulfilled. So we looked at the renewed roadmap. And this year it's even less than 42% which we had previously. We also calculated the draft uh, laws uh, 
which uh, could be considered as steps of the fulfillment of the recommendation. Uh, that's why on some uh, recommendations, uh, we can see uh, that uh, we are not moving forward. In fact, uh, in September, uh, the situation uh, looked uh, a bit better, but it's still less uh, than 50% of uh, uh, fulfillment of this roadmap. But I'm uh, underlying the necessity to review those roadmap. But uh, until we do not have a new one, uh, we will uh, be focusing on this one and evaluating our steps against this one. But we cannot say that nothing uh, was done. So if we compare on the number of recommendations, so uh, one of them was uh, to decrease the number of the committees, it was done. Uh, then uh, the uh, Monet dialogue collaboration uh, started. Uh, we are participating, and the previous speaker, Andrew Parubi, was the leader of this uh, reform, participates in the dialogue. We can also recollect uh, the fact that the work started on the draft law on the opposition, the new uh, reading of the law on political parties. From the recent uh, activities, maybe you know about uh, the accounting uh, chamber uh, report. Uh, there are a lot of interesting facts there. Uh, the report is not optimistic, but uh, the fact that we have this report uh, is uh, also a sign that we fulfilled one of the recommendations. Uh, then uh, uh, registration uh, of the draft law on uh, the uh, supervision. We believe that it's also one of the steps on the uh, roadmap fulfillment. If we're speaking about, and also I forgot about the digitalization that from the COVID times, different uh, instruments uh, are used by the uh, committees and uh, I think it's great about the challenges and issues that's what uh, Julia mentioned the, the lack of comprehensive approach and we saw it from the initiatives on the amending the constitution uh, if we recollect how they are uh, positioned uh, in the TV, that they were positioned uh, as a parliamentary reform. That's the uh, uh, draft law on the decrease uh, of the number of MPs uh, from 450 to 30. It's not a systematic approach, in fact. Those uh, initiatives and steps, uh, which have very low uh, legal uh, expertise, um, and we have three uh, negative opinions uh, on them, and uh, they are quite populistic. So th these initiatives are on the decrease of the number of, of uh, the parliament uh, to 300, and uh, there is uh, an opinion of the constitution called uh, that uh, there was a discrepancy between uh, different uh, the important laws and it was not uh, considered by the authors of uh, the draft laws. So uh, this draft law should be uh, rewritten, but uh, the law uh, was adopted in the first reading. Uh, so, and for the sitting reading, there is no, uh, not enough uh, votes, and then there is an uh, opinion uh, on, on the opinion of the Constitutional Court, and then uh, the uh, this question was uh, put uh, to the uh, polling uh, before the uh, local elections. Uh, so it looks like the president is trying uh, to find a way around the decision of the Constitutional Court. So the um, low quality of the draft laws is also uh, is an issue. 
another issue which is influencing the implementation of, of the reform is uh, the uh, dysfunctioning or disbalance of, of uh, the powers um, between the president and the parliament and the former uh, prime minister uh, was claiming that uh, there was uh, no control over the cabinet of ministers and it's it became a great news for the MPs uh, that uh, they can suggest uh, a position uh, of the uh, prime minister. So you uh, understand what I meant. So what about the first steps which uh, should be done? For, to renew the road map, from what I know last year, the decree uh, of uh, the uh, speaker of the parliament, the new working group was established, and it was one of the tasks um, to renew this roadmap. But from what I know, nothing has happened, and there is no decree which uh, we can take into consideration uh, when evaluating the uh, recommendations for filming. Uh, then to uh, come to the point when we uh, should uh, uh, adopt the law on the civil service, then uh, to adopt the code of the ethics of MPs. And while uh, we are here, then parliament and constitution, the amendments to the uh, constitution are needed and we believe that they should be done only through the parliament. Why we should do this? Because without the comprehensive amendments to the parliament, the parliamentary reform cannot be fulfilled. So that the voting by a simple majority for general laws and we would uh, also uh, like to have uh, the idea of the number of the initiatives by one MP. Thank you for a very detailed uh, comment on the parliamentary reform. I can see uh, that uh, through Zoom we have the uh, Olga Sovgera. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Maybe you have heard a part of our discussion. And we have the following question about the uh, parliamentary reform in the course of the constitutional reform, because uh, we cannot uh, fulfill them separately. So what do you think about the change of the status of the parliament and also on the number of the, uh, the MPs? Uh, As for the decrease in the number of the MPs, and you know that there was the first uh, voting of the MPs, and it received 236 uh, MPs, uh, uh, which means uh, that it's uh, quite complicated to find the 300 uh, MPs uh, to have a final vote. At least uh, there are no uh, talks uh, that uh, this uh, law will be put on voting in the parliament. As uh, for the nearest step about amending the constitution, I can say that there is a quite active work on uh, drafting uh, amendments in the part of the decentralization. And and the, uh, members of the Commission Там, on the, the Judicial Reform are involved, and there are experts on the Constitutional Law, also the um, Academia from the National Law Academy are involved. There was a working group two days ago where they discussed the main topic which should be improved. And uh, right now there are some difficulties uh, in amending the Constitution, the reform on the decentralization is uh, moving in a different pace uh, or direction that uh, it was uh, originally intended uh, to do. So, uh, yesterday, the law 3051 was voted, while the transfer of assets uh, uh, was uh, uh, 
manipulated, uh, and, and it's one of the parts of the final stages uh, of decentralization. And the uh, new uh, communities uh, were established. So, we should have started, I was saying this also in our faction, but we should have started with the amending the constitution we understand it quite clearly, uh, but maybe... Uh, that we do not uh, understand the, the uh, way how we should have uh, adopted those laws, but in reality, uh, right now, uh, it's not possible to receive physically the opinion of the constitutional court. Uh, but the processes which are happening at the regional level require the steps uh, the immediate steps. If we have followed the 100% right way, then we couldn't have conducted the local elections according to the territorial division, which was introduced on the decree on the district's division. And and uh, on amending the constitution, uh, we are now working on the uh, topic uh, on um, appointing the heads of, of the Anti-Corruption Bureau and the National Investigation Bureau. In autumn 2019, the Constitutional Court gave a negative opinion on the procedure which was suggested in the part uh, of amending the constitution. The appointment of, of the head should be done by the president, uh, except the heads of the National Anti-Corruption Bureau and National Investigation Bureau and the Constitutional Court uh, indicated that there is a, a dubious uh, understanding of what uh, is an independent uh, regulatory authority. And right now we are working on the issue that uh, those heads of uh, National Interruption Bureau and National Investigation uh, should be uh, appointed uh, on equal terms uh, and now that the President will be appointing them with uh, the approval of the Parliament and, and uh, the uh, Commission, uh, Competition Commission uh, will uh, be suggesting the candidates for those positions. That's the model which we are considering as the main one. Thank you, Mrs. Olham. We are continuing our discussion and I would like to uh, discuss the oversight uh, uh, supervision uh, powers of the parliament uh, and we would like to hear uh, your idea, Mr. Igor Kovut. Uh, thank you for the invitation to this forum. It's a uh, a very respectable platform uh, for discussions for discussion of uh, reforms uh, uh, to emphasize uh, certain opinions this year indeed uh, has been extraordinary in our political and social lives in our expert lives in our reform lives so if for SMEs uh, lockdowns and quarantines um, uh, are uh, some uh, striking events um, for our process, uh, uh, COVID and the pandemic uh, uh, also play an important role and uh, uh, make an impact. So the, the priorities uh, shift. Uh, along with that line, uh, according to Alexander, the transition of the parliament uh, uh, to the online mode of operation, thanks uh, uh, God, uh, some uh, technical capabilities have been prepared for that. The e-office and uh, electronic um, uh, uh, parliamentary um, uh, meetings and the equipment has been procured. Uh, we still have a few challenges that the current Ukrainian parliament is facing. Uh, and. I'm not really talking here about the control function, but about the f general philosophy um, and uh, the course of the parliamentary constitutional reforms. It's clear that uh, that 
we're trying to uh, avoid the word constitutional crisis at this panel. Uh, um, uh, but each crisis has several sources. Source number one is with regards to uh, the judges and the court, uh, I can't speak from a political standpoint, but all the elected individuals in the country, their performance is evaluated according to two uh, parameters, uh, professionalism and integrity. It's a classical approach, but uh, we shouldn't hunt the witches, right? So that we have to have uh, um, to see our drawbacks as well. And I think that the main drawback uh, that, that, that such decisions of the Constitutional Court uh, uh, emerge is the low quality of uh, the l legislation, uh, which uh, um, where we don't account for some provisions of the Constitution. I still remember the list of um, of, of paragraphs uh, uh, in the uh, conclusion of the opinion of uh, uh, the um, uh, chief uh, department of uh, the evaluation committee of the, of the of the legislation that there were some mismatches with the constitution uh, uh, in the Verkhovna Rada. And when the uh, political expediency, uh, uh, expediency dominates, it doesn't matter which convocation it is. Uh, and we neglect the procedure, we neglect the examination, we neglect consultations and uh, uh, the participation of stakeholders. We neglect uh, uh, an open, inclusive uh, our pro process uh, of uh, discussions and debates because the parliament is the place for that. We have such crises. So this is how we can go back to this parliamentary reform and to look at, I'm not really talking about the roadmap of the European Parliament because this roadmap, it seems to me, is kind of um, uh, relevant and irrelevant. There are some principal things there, uh, such as the reinforcement of the control function of the Parliament, the reinforcement of the um, capacity uh, of uh, HR and training programs and so on. and, and uh, uh, but uh, there are other things where, where we treat the, the, the internal reform of the parliament and mostly it's about the relations between uh, the government and the parliament. Mm, it's about uh, uh, the wrong uh, addresses, let's put it this way. Uh, uh, when uh, the recommendations of the civil society it speaks of the end-to-end -end, uh, approach uh, where, where we draft um, uh, bills uh, uh, on, uh, under strategic planning, uh, policy making, uh, uh, the green bulletins and everything, something that has been practiced in the West as a, a normal uh, um, public policy uh, making process. And we understand that the why it is uh, uh, referred to the parliament exclusively, because the parliament has the fullness of constitutional power to demand that of the government, that we encounter another problem, uh, both at the parliament and government levels, is the uh, capacity to exercise uh, this activity. It's quite low uh, because I work with the model committees uh, of the, the parliament. So we communicate uh, to uh, the uh, government with uh, deputy ministers and secretaries. We see a substantial lack of professional staff that are capable of doing that work in a in high quality and offer political decisions, legislative decisions to the parliament. In the parliament, of course, the pandemic and the lockdown and the, actually uh, demonstrated, uh, demonstrated that we have to uh, focus on the internal resources of uh, I improving and increasing professionalism and uh, the technical uh, uh, reset of the parliament. It's more of a resource uh, uh, improvement. And the fact that we have to be prepared for such circumstances should be easy and simple and shouldn't require uh, um, uh, certain internal investments. It's very difficult for the Brooklyn Rider to uh, set up a training or a, a work meeting with the apparatus. I mean, it's fine with the members of parliament because everybody uses uh, uh, his gadgets. Uh, or tablets, but uh, uh, it, it, 
the apparatus has to use its own resources, so his own, their own resources, so their own gadgets. So that's important because uh, in actual fact, we have felt how the technical assistance program um, uh, uh, has been focused on capacity building of the apparatus through trainings, through uh, so, uh, discussions with uh, other parliaments, other, other, other countries. Uh, becoming complex and unattainable for uh, um, the representatives of the Ukrainian uh, parliament. Um, and if we talk about this roadmap, we do view a very slow progress at the internal reform uh, level. We see some progress and uh, thanks to the leadership of the uh, speaker, the management, of the Verkhovna Rada and uh, the management of the apparatus thereof. Uh, these may not be quite obvious uh, for the general public, but uh, uh, we see this in the structure of the apparatus. New divisions are being formed, new potential is uh, being assigned. Uh, the uh, research service, for instance, uh, it's Ukrainian know-how, but uh, it's quite uh, successful. The division um, uh, uh, for the promotion of communication between the members of parliament and their constituencies. So uh, they are far reaching investments uh, to develop the Ukrainian parliament and its institutional capacity building. With regards to the control function, um, it's about the constitutional approach, institutional approach, and the legislative approach um, for the parliament. The 4131 draft uh, bill, which was mentioned, uh, and the amendments to which we have to submit, uh, is the first Apollo star, which, which is going to give a benchmark for the parliament on how to um, uh, to uh, promote the uh, capacity um, uh, for the government and the funds. Uh, there are uh, some deficiencies, but we stand for this draft law to be considered and approved with the amendments being proposed by the members of parliament. It's a very interesting initiative because this is the initiative of the speaker and heads of the all the heads of committees, it uh, unites the parliament, it unites the need of the society for the parliament to exercise this important function, which um, has been substantially underestimated. And there's, uh, meanwhile, we have a complex situation, uh, which is the formation of the government. That is the uh, uh, the statutory powers of the parliament. Uh, Shapoval calls it a, an HR function of the parliament. Uh, there are a lot of different definitions, but when now, whenever we have the government where, where some of the MPs here for the first time that they can uh, propose of the prime minister and when the government and uh, uh, the prime minister undergo a casting at the presidential administration office, uh, the president's office, they will never feel their responsibility to the citizens. So this important political and philosophic and constitutional bond where the parliament being filled with the representation uh, function as it represents uh, the interests of the citizens, as it translates uh, 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 the, these interests and requirements should play its decisive role in the formation of the government is leveled down. Um, so is the nature of control. Uh, and this is what we have to work on. Uh, what is uh, parliamentary control in the, uh, the governance uh, uh, system? It's about ensuring um, a simple things that the founding fathers in the US were talking about, that the parliament should have 
uh, should should be able to uh, um, to um, oppose uh, to um, now a lot uh, of uh, um, presidential or uh, um, other uh, other um, arguments uh, as it has certain control functions. Um, and when we talk about such uh, institutions uh, as uh, the Chamber of uh, uh, Accounts, um, I think we have to more professionally uh, approach uh, um, uh, um, to the work uh, with it. It's also about the um, uh, human rights, but this draft law 3141, uh, which we advocate and uh, which according to us uh, should be the first uh, link in the formation of the culture of parliamentary control and the function of uh, uh, parliamentary control also uh, plays the role of uh, capacity of parliamentary committees. I think in the system of a parliamentary reform, we have to carefully look at the changes which are being, uh, being propo proposed for the parliament uh, to um, uh, strengthen the um, capacity uh, building uh, and uh, uh, the uh, staff development mm, be because there's a positive uh, perception uh, 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 by uh, the uh, the perception of the new procedure of uh, uh, parliamentary hearings and uh, consultations uh, uh, with working with the stakeholders uh, knowing who to consult with and how to consult um, to be democratically inclusive and transparent and what to demand of the government as uh, it works with uh, the legislators. I've always uh, mentioned that in the recommendations uh, um, to the civil uh, of the civil society, we've always uh, uh, been uh, focused uh, on a clear drafting of the procedure of uh, uh, legislation. In this situation, I don't understand the sources of the laws. So where do the laws come from? Whose um, ideas are they? How do they become, uh, uh, how, how, how do they turn into the laws? It's, uh, is it the government? Is it the president? Is it the parliament? Uh, when it comes to the, uh, um, interests of the voters uh, in the constituencies, uh, it's good. It's the function of each member of uh, the parliament, uh, but where is the political program uh, with which a certain party has won, uh, with uh, which they had a program mandate, and, uh, uh, and the complex of legislative uh, initiatives. I don't understand where these laws originate. And then how do we control them? the so-called post-legislative scrutiny. It's very important uh, uh, to the enforcement. How can we um, scrutinize the laws if we don't see the indicators? We don't have any uh, reasonable things that would uh, indicate uh, uh, the execution of under execution of the philosophy which was behind the laws. Um, and it's also about the capability of the cabinet ministers as well as the uh, capability of um, the cabinet ministers and the Verkhovna Rada to work with that. We value the efforts of the Verkhovna Rada, uh, uh, the secretariats and the um, committees of the secretariats, but I think there's a big need in uh, reinforcing this capability uh, through trainings, uh, through interacting with the cabinet, through institutionalizing of, of the relations with the cabinet. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Igor, for such a detailed and in-depth analysis. I can't but agree with you um, on the issues of the legislative uh, work of the Rakhona Rada. We have Mr. Petrosituk, uh, who is uh, 
establishing the uh, connection Katia, through Zoom. Which yes, yeah. thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so you have heard our discussion, haven't you? Could you share your ideas uh, about the constitutional reform? Which provisions of the constitution uh, require adjustments, uh, yeah, if yeah, any? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you for the invitation. I will try to concisely make a few statements which, in my opinion, uh, could become part of this panel. So, statement one on the target of the constitutional reform. What is the reform for? What is it intended for? Um, for is it the time for such a reform? And who should um, shape the reforms and who should be able to answer this question? But uh, prior to that, let me ask uh, you a short question. Who implements the reforms? And the key stakeholders are the parliament, the president, as the head of state, and the members of parliament. And it seems to me the answer here is about the goal of any reforms. Uh, it doesn't matter those that have taken place or which will take place. And it's part two of Article 3 of the Constitution of Ukraine, ensuring the freedoms of uh, citizens is uh, the main uh, obligation of the state. Uh, in other words, should the constitutional reform have no end uh, result or goal? I think uh, we can't uh, think of its execution. Uh, I think it's the very basis for any, any constitutional reform, while the regulatory basis would be Article 19 of the Ukrainian Constitution, Part 2, which says uh, that the uh, government institutions and officials should act within uh, the limits of its powers according to the Constitution. So our reform, including uh, the constitutional reform, if needed, should uh, attain its goal. That's statement one. Now, statement two. We can't avoid this. The word combination, a constitutional reform and the constitutional crisis are being mentioned in the last few uh, weeks. The top officials uh, mention it, the uh, political scientists uh, mention it. Uh, the fact that the crisis is there, yes. Is it a constitutional crisis? I doubt it. Neither in terms of its name uh, nor in terms of its essence, whether it's a degradation uh, or worsening of uh, uh, some uh, conflict, so opposition. Nothing has changed since uh, May or June. There is no constitutional crisis as such. Yet this might be a crisis, I'm not sure. It's a crisis of the Institute of Constitutional Justice. Because the constitutional the court is not in a critical state. It survived a crisis associated with the dismissal of one of the judges, who we won't call the names, who was also the head of the constitutional court. That was a crisis. So, well, the constitutional court, well, the votes have split up, right? Um, as a new decision was made. So, so there is no uh, crisis of the constitutional justice. We are witnessing the crisis of the uh, interstate governance, I think. We are witnessing a crisis of relations between as sad as it is, between the uh, presidential office, the presidential chancellor, and one of the central institution, institutional uh, bodies, the constitutional court. Uh, Mr. Bonislavsky is absent now, but it seems to me that 
цій ситуації є, на жаль, особистісний момент. Unfortunately, there's a personal issue. As a judge of the Constitutional Court, I, I served uh, um, for 10 years as a judge of the Constitutional Court, even though the Constitution provides for 9 years of that service. Um, I was able to work within several systems where we had uh, three heads of state, uh, Yushchenko, Yanukovych, and almost three years under Poroshenko. And I have seen different heads of administrations, secretariats, their deputies, representatives of the Constitutional Court, and we never had such a confrontation between the office of the head of state and the constitutional body. It's not a private issue, it's a state issue. So that's the, that's the second statement. And uh, according to Germans, all the best is three is the phenomenon of constitutional reforms. I guess we can name at least three things here. Constitutional reforms should be comprehensive, it should be balanced, and it should clearly... Answer, uh, the question of the constitutional essence. And I think uh, that any law on constitutional reform should have an explanatory note such as we have the, uh, uh, on the corruption risks. Uh, how the freedoms and rights of citizens will be improved and how the state will uh, be better uh, um, uh, will we'll be improving them. I think Olga uh, has left, and it seems to me that even a draft law on the constitutional amendments to reduce uh, the number of MPs uh, uh, from 450 to 300 can ask the question, how can such a reduction uh, improve the freedoms and rights of citizens. So these are the three major statements with regards to the phenomenon of a constitutional reform that I can make. Thank you, Mr. Peter. I have the, the next question to Mr. Yulia Zajimko about the parliamentary reform. Since we haven't completely covered the issue of a parliamentary um, control and scrutiny. Um, Hello, dear colleagues. Thank you for the invitation to this conference. I am deputy uh, head of the Office of Parliamentary Reform, and our office uh, operates as a part of the Parliamentary Reform project supported by EU and is being implemented by the UNDP program. Um, for over a year, we have been working as an advisory group for the uh, management uh, leadership of the Verkhovna Rada and the management of the apparatus of the Verkhovna Rada. And as we, as I refer back to the previous speeches to summarize this discussion, the sectoral discussion, I'd like to argue that as we talk about the parliamentary reform and the constitutional reform, everyone would agree with me that we are primarily focusing on the pressing need to improve the decision-making processes. Uh, as I have worked for over a year with the leadership of the Verkhovna Rada, I see that there are uh, issues of following the regulations, uh, uh, the legislation on the committees, but there are uh, issues of improving the entire system based on which political decisions are made and implemented and uh, how they're communicated to the public and why certain points of the agenda are on the priority list and others aren't. Uh, so we had uh, a few key tasks, uh, our office had a few key tasks, uh, most of which we've implemented, our project is uh, going to end next February. And the first task was to understand the algorithm of planning of this legislative work. How is the agenda uh, planned and scheduled, why some of the draft laws make the uh, way to the session hall so fast, others are postponed uh, till several years. 
so we've developed recommendations on the approaches on how to plan the legislative work. We see that last year, the amendments to the regulations uh, were made and we have a new tool as a, a legislative uh, plan. But uh, as we worked partly to support the Rahona Rada to uh, form this plan, to compile this plan, the mechanism of its implementation, we saw that there are certain issues about in terms of the interaction of all the um, uh, the um, uh, subjects of the legislative initiative uh, and, and the constitutional reform. Uh, our office also was tasked uh, with prioritizing the legislative initiative. So, uh, we have also developed recommendations on which uh, draft laws must be on the priority list. And we provided our recommendations uh, uh, for the plan of the legislative work to become the basis uh, in the Verkhovna Rada. We are very grateful to the leadership of the parliament. This plan was included in the resolution draft. We prepared uh, the proposals of legislative uh, amendments uh, to improve the uh, legislative planning I'd like to uh, draw your attention to the fact that we're not just working with the parliament, we also uh, engage uh, sectoral um, committees of the secretariat of the cabinet of ministers, uh, because whenever we talk about planning, it's about the algorithms of interaction of all the legislative um, 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 uh, agencies. Uh, and there's a lot of work that precedes uh, the le legislative uh, uh, work. Uh, who actually um is responsible for the legislative work uh, for the drafting of uh, the laws uh, where the responsible persons don't know how to implement them and how to uh, draft sub laws um, we've developed recommendations on the um, the assessment of the impact of the draft laws we also developed legislative proposals to improve the list of uh, uh, supportive documents um, because uh, we've covered some uh, broad issues, but then it all comes down how the draft uh, laws are verified when they uh, make their way to the apparatus. Uh, if they mm, have uh, uh, enough uh, grounds uh, um, for uh, um, uh, their uh, rejection. As uh, a part of our project uh, and our office, we've uh, uh, developed the, uh, uh, the uh, the control uh, functions implementation. But uh, then uh, came the question of the capability of the secretariat, uh, because the reform of the parliament is associated with uh, the public administration reform in Ukraine and the capability and the analytical skills and the sufficiency of the, the, the skills and the sufficiency of the human resources that uh, support the day-to-day -day work of the parliament. With regards to the committees, um, uh, I'd like to argue and uh, point to a very simple thing is the approach to the uh, planning of uh, the work uh, uh, in the committees. They haven't really changed for decades uh, because the committee plans its work for a single session. Uh, maybe it's worth really uh, 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 switching to international practices, uh, uh, to some strategic planning, uh, because the committees are uh, the entities that can engage a broad um, a, a circle uh, of uh, stakeholders, the public, where, where they uh, they can uh, recommend uh, uh, the initiative set to uh, the members of parliament in the session hall. So we provided our recommendations to the planning and hopefully they will be taken into account by the leadership of the Verkhovna Rada and will be implemented. Uh, also, according to my colleagues, what happens after these uh, draft laws are passed. We realize that no reform in this country can be successfully implemented without the change in the approach uh, of the Verkhovna Rada and the government. So the question remains outstanding whether the parliament has been implementing its um, control function, its scrutiny functions. Uh, we welcome this uh, first uh, um, uh, reading uh, of uh, of the law, uh, and we've developed several proposals, and we hope that um, that they will also be accounted for in the second reading in uh, the course of submitting proposals to this draft law, which it can be partially uh, improved. Uh, and also, how is analytical work conducted in terms uh, uh, of uh, monitoring? Uh, 
uh, uh, of how the draft law is uh, a draft law is implemented. We have um, analyzed uh, the experience of um, developed uh, economies, experience uh, um, how the uh, 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 committees uh, exercise that function. This would, should be the tool of efficient control and oversight of how the law is implemented. Um, uh, the uh, monitoring uh, over the ambiguity of some of the draft laws and whether the sub laws are uh, drafted uh, uh, timely and how should a certain provision in the law should be implemented. And we have uh, provided to uh, uh, separate uh, committees uh, the recommendations on the uh, administration of certain laws. Uh, we've had a lot of interesting facts that we have found there and we've identified a lot of systemic problems. Uh, hopefully we will publish some of these reports and uh, uh, they will be uh, adopted by our sectoral committees. My, my most we should also be conscious that the parliament is not only adopting the laws for the reforms, but there should be the oversight uh, within the parliament. Uh, the, this is an important issue, the parliamentary oversight. Not only the improvement, the parliamentary procedures, we were also focused on the uh, reforming the administration of the parliament. We also uh, had assessed uh, the functioning of the administration of the parliament, and we are supporting the digital uh, solutions which could make the work of the administration of the parliament easier and also to make the work of the MPs and the assistant uh, more efficient. So the experts should be focused on the reform of the parliament as a new algorithm of uh, taking the decisions uh, and uh, also in collaboration with uh, the president. We should be moving to the understanding of this reform and to work uh, with all our efforts on this uh, conceptual vision uh, of collaboration and finding the solutions in the state. Thank you, Mr. Yulia. We still uh, have time for final remarks. So, uh, dear speakers, if you would like to comment or to add uh, something to your speeches, you have your time. Um, I would like to start. I'm very thankful to Mr. Igor for touching the issue of the mediation, uh, media uh, topic of uh, parliamentary crisis. Uh, thanks to Petros Tesiuk who identified what is happening right now. Of course, our panel discussion could have been a theoretical one and uh, without this uh, media uh, component. But I would like to add, so uh, let's have a different point of view. As soon as there is a conflict within the mechanism of uh, power or any complication uh, in collaboration between uh, different institutions we have and it's quite obvious there are channels and also the aggressor from russian federation which start the information um, attack at one that it's uh, an institutional crisis uh, that uh, our institutions are not capable that's why from the point of uh, ukrainian society point of view we should understand this and give a clear answer. Of course, we could have had the constitutional crisis if we were supporting emotionally non-constitutional uh, initiatives of the president. We are lucky that they stopped in the parliament, so the parliament took a pause and is searching for the answer. And now I'm coming to the answer. To our mind, so where this constitutional court appeared, it's such a big issue. So so how happened this constitutional court? And then there is a, a quite obvious answer. Six uh, justices are from, uh, are appointed by the parliament, sixes are from the president. And then we are finding out that 
two justices are not appointed by the parliament and it's with the fact that we have one majority in the parliament and they are not appointing two new justices for the constitutional court so let's move forward so everyone is uh, uh, saying we have uh, an issue uh, with the lawyers who are justices in the constitutional court in uh, 2016 it was an attempt to give an answer there was a reform of the constitutional court there was the issue uh, was identified that the parliament and the uh, president and uh, the judges uh, showed their low political um, professionalism and uh, we had uh, uh, the case that uh, people were appointed uh, to the position of justices due to their political uh, loyalty. So the two new requirements were written down, professionalism and high moral qualities. Then the law on the constitutional court uh, just neglected it that the, the, the new appointed justice should be first uh, approved by the faction. So the competitive uh, selection uh, should be approved. And the two new justices uh, should be appointed when they have the professional and high quality moral values. Uh, and also uh, the uh, assembly of uh, the courts should have a look at this in December. So uh, I agree with Mrs. Julia what she is saying. Uh, that we should uh, consider parliamentary reform as a uh, part of the comprehensive reform of decision-taking process. I will be again mentioning this roadmap. The first recommendation stipulates uh, that the concept uh, should be drafted from the beginning and uh, it should include all uh, three components uh, of our uh, powers. I was confused to get to know that at the beginning of 2016, the roadmap was uh, presented, then the decree on its implementation uh, was uh, adopted, and the draft laws were submitted to the parliament for the implementation of uh, separate uh, recommendations. So the first recommendation was to have a comprehensive uh, approach to the decision-taking process. And uh, this recommendation was considered only one year after. So uh, this illusion of the existence of simple uh, solutions. I will not tell you what the specific uh, steps to be taken, but I will be speaking in general. This oversight function is linked with the, the parliamentary one. So if the parliament is uh, overloaded with uh, the legislative work, they do not have the time for the monitoring of the implementation of the legislation. So when we were drafting the concept, um, or, uh, the, con the concept we calculated uh, the number of uh, items in the agenda of, of all the committees and the percentage uh, of uh, issues uh, which were linked with the oversight or uh, control was only three percent all the other uh, questions uh, or topics were linked to, to the draft uh, laws so the np and the parliament are mainly focused on the legislative initiative uh, power and but in the modern world when the processes are becoming more and more complicated and more and more data should be gathered and analyzed the government should have a leading role in forming the policy but at the same time the parliament is not losing its legislative power or value because 
at this time uh, the legislative and the oversight powers of the parliament are joined because before adopting the new legislation the parliament should check uh, the uh, initiatives of the government um, to the interests of uh, the citizens uh, to the uh, coalition's uh, idea and so on and uh, Igor Levich uh, brought me to one uh, idea I noticed uh, a trend uh, which started in 2004. So, uh, what were the procedural um, violations of the constitutional uh, reform? Or maybe even in 2000, when we, there were some unclear issues with the referendum. It looks this way uh, that what Igor Lekovic mentioned. The key stakeholders, the leaders, uh, have a, a vision of simple solutions, quick wins, let's say, uh, and they neglecting the procedures. And as a result, uh, they are then uh, suffer from the outcomes. And also the institutions are suffering as well. And when uh, they uh, receive those strikes uh, of the uh, deal, the institutionalization, uh, then it's uh, difficult uh, to speak uh, about the trust to those institutions. For example, the uh, party of regions in 2012, uh, they adopted this institutional a law on pan-Ukrainian referendum. They just ignored the, the idea, uh, the uh, fact that they uh, should uh, have also adopted the law uh, on the local referendums. Uh, the same uh, is uh, with the AIDS convocation. When the rules of the uh, procedures were not brought in line with the different legislation. And when the speaker uh, was being asked whether uh, do you have a coalition? And we do not know, we do not uh, uh, what to answer because the rules of procedures is not brought in line with the constitution. And that's why the uh, decision of the pre uh, president now on uh, the new elections of the uh, parliament it came to life. So uh, some political priorities are set in front uh, of uh, the interests. Monsieur, in brief, I would like, as Monsieur, to say, uh, not to have our panel discussion uh, as a very theoretical one and discussing of the rules of procedures and so on. I'd like to think that the parliamentary reform should be considered in a realistic point of view. We uh, have very unfortunate cases when the legislation was adopted without uh, the necessary analytics and the influence on the budget and without uh, analysis of the capacity of the government of ministers to implement it and with the courts to have uh, it as in a case uh, a law. And we know that uh, there were appeals uh, to the European Court of Human uh, Rights. And we saw that uh, there were negative consequences, um, uh, that there, there were debts uh, uh, of the state to those claimants to the European Court of Human Rights. And that's only because there is no adequate analysis and expertise of the legislation which is now submitted to the parliament. And that's why we uh, were submitting the, the procedure how we should analyze uh, this and how the public uh, consultations should be held, but also how uh, the uh, 
results of those consultations should be taken into consideration. This uh, parliamentary reform is a very practical and realistic one, which influences every citizen's and uh, their life and existence of our state and the budget as well. Also, I would like to thank to the colleague, to colleagues for their speeches and to say that now we should uh, consider uh, the practice which exists. We should improve the requirements to the legislation and our Ukrainian culture should uh, Consider it not as a limitation of the right of the legislative initiative. When we look at uh, the states with stable democracy, uh, that uh, any citizenship is not goes uh, into uh, the development of the legislation. But uh, to think uh, who uh, can uh, draft uh, a better uh, legislation uh, on uh, the specific area. For example, it could be a ministry where 300 employees are working or one MP with two assistants. I think that the, uh, the, the ministries should draft uh, the legislation uh, with the consultations uh, of uh, uh, civil society and um, NGOs and employees from the branches. And uh, it's a way to the quality, but not to the uh, but not the limitation to the MPTs. It's a more civilized uh, legislative process. Thanks a lot. A great uh, panel. Uh, we haven't talked about the parliamentary oversight for a long time. It's a, a real way to reform to the change. And what is a reform? in institutional uh, point of view. It's a change of behavior. If we have some shifts in the work of the committee, if uh, people uh, will uh, start coming to the committees and then to report on their work, if we uh, have greater attention to the reports of the accounting chamber. I just wanted to pay attention to some uh, points. First of all, the uh, accounting chamber is not a repressive institution. So uh, some people thought that uh, accounting chamber will act as a repressive uh, agency. It's in fact an audit agency, which is necessary for the parliament to have a oversight on the legislative um, uh, perspective. So uh, it could be an improvement of quality. Of course, uh, anyone can make mistakes, uh, especially in the forecast or planning of finances. Every state, uh, every democracy, every government, uh, unfortunately, can uh, make a mistake. Uh, uh, the citizens uh, do remember those mistakes and uh, they can check uh, change uh, uh, for in the next election. And the parliament uh, can have this uh, parliamentary scrutiny. And uh, as uh, citizens, we cannot uh, ask uh, the minister to give us the report, uh, but uh, a parliament as uh, a representative of uh, people had this power. And uh, that's why from the representative point of view, the parliament uh, should uh, have the authority and exercise this power to ask the government to be accountable. And it can be done only with the parliamentary oversight. That's why this uh, legis uh, draft law in, in 3941 gives the possibility to establish uh, those possibilities. But how those reports are being drafted and how the parliament and the government collaborate. And it's an important task which is in front of us. 
We will see uh, how it functions. I hope that uh, this uh, convocation of the parliament will uh, show uh, the change in the behavior also in uh, when we have a, a constitutional commission or anyway. Uh, the USA uh, Rada will uh, support different uh, aid uh, formats of collaboration. We are uh, are ready to work uh, on the improvement uh, and uh, also uh, sharing the idea uh, of the representation and collaboration with the citizens. But when we are speaking about such practical aspects as uh, policy uh, forming or uh, consultations, uh, public consultation, uh, we are uh, highlighting about the involvement of the uh, civil society. We believe that the public consultations uh, should also include uh, the uh, represent of the stakeholders and which uh, represent the, uh, for example, some businesses could be trade unions or so on. So, uh, uh, for example, the uh, individual entrepreneurs uh, and so on. So the civil society uh, should uh, know that, uh, for example, if they uh, unite uh, on some professional uh, level, they should be ready that uh, they should suggest a, a, a specific solution. Of course, it's a democracy and they should have the right to gather under the parliament. But if we are willing to have the functional uh, outcome, we should be uh, ready to suggest proposals and it will be uh, part uh, of this process, which is in fact very interesting and very um, valuable one. Uh, Mr. Petro, thank you for being online. Uh, do you have your comment? Just two minutes, please. I believe uh, that our panel discussion is one of the best uh, one in your forum. Constitutional and parliamentary reform. And of course, there is always place for improvement. We could have added, we could have added um, just uh, two columns saying constitutional reform, parliament as a factor of this reform. At the beginning of my speech, I forgot to answer to one of the questions of this speaker. One of the best reforms which we can speak about that the transition of Ukraine to the parliamentary type of power. And everything we have uh, talked uh, the, uh, that from Poland to Norway, to, uh, to Montenegro and uh, uh, other countries after the Second World War, uh, almost all those countries are uh, parliamentary uh, countries. They have mixed types uh, and uh, everything is uh, now in the framework of the uh, parliamentary type of power. So the national, constitutional, modern countries after World War II decided or came back uh, to the parliamentary form of ruling. And it means that uh, it's the, the best uh, option for the uh, uh, ruling. So of course, it's not good uh, in the time when we have uh, the, uh, the active warfare, but uh, I believe that it will come to an end at some time, and we will have to reform uh, the constitutional uh, system in the way uh, that we uh, should have the parliamentary form of law. And the last statement, Professor Volodymyr Starosolsky has a very nice thesis. He died, but he has a uh, 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 the uh, constitutional state, and there is a, a part uh, constitutional uh, crisis. 
that they intercept the curfew. So it was written in the middle of the circus. The Anglia, of uh, and Anglia, when the, the he is Anglia, describing Anglia, England and uh, he, he, he is paying attention to the, the first uh, 100 years they had issues because uh, uh, the uh, uh, king had uh, their own uh, MPs and there were oligarchs who had their own peace. And in uh, 1710, uh, when they uh, moved to, to the classical types of uh, parliamentary ruling, so uh, we do not uh, have any uh, other type as to move to this system as well. Thank you, Mr. Petro. I'm very thankful to all the speakers who had all those great ideas and on uh, the reform. Thank you for the organizers uh, for the, this event and let's see each other further.